I do want that closure more so that this doesn't happen to someone else. June 21st, 2013. The local police in Gloucester Township got a call to check on 59-year-old Carol Reef. She had missed a family trip and wasn't picking up her phone, which sparked concern. The officers headed to Lakeview Apartments at 590 Lower Landing Road, her home, only to find her car parked there, but no trace of Carol. It wasn't until three days later, on June 24th, by 11.47 a.m., that they discovered Carol's body in a secluded area behind an old maintenance building in the complex. An autopsy was performed, but the exact cause of her death remained unclear due to the state of decomposition, as per police records. Who orchestrated Carol's disappearance, leading to her untimely demise? What sinister events transpired on that fateful summer day, casting a dark cloud over the once peaceful complex? Gloucester Township, situated in New Jersey, had a population of 64,034 as of 2020. Known for its rich history and suburban lifestyle, it's a place where community ties are strong. With a mix of recreational and historic spots, residents enjoy a blend of past and present. The population is diverse, making it a vibrant place to live. However, like any place, it has its share of crimes, which brings us back to the unsolved mystery of Carol Reif's case from 2013, now reopened in 2023, drawing attention to the crime rate in the area. Carol Reef was born on December 22, 1953, in Norristown, PA, to Eleanor Neiman Reef Cameron and Richard V. Stanwood. She later moved to Blackwood, New Jersey, after spending some years in Conshohocken. A graduate of Plymouth White Marsh High School, class of 1971, Carol was active in her community. She worked at Admiral Insurance Company in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and was a former St. Mark's Lutheran Church member in Conshohocken. Known for her athletic spirit, she was a Southern Ocean Running Club member and even organized a charity run named Shamrocks for Sandy. Carol loved the outdoors, enjoying trips to the beach and camping adventures. She left behind a close-knit family including her mother, daughter Dawn M. Santani, several siblings, and three grandchildren, Avalon, Shay, and Sam. She had two daughters. Sadly, she had faced the loss of one of her daughters, Nicole Lynn Reitheimer, and brother Kenneth Reif earlier. Carol was remembered fondly by her family, especially for her gentle nature and love for running. Despite adversities, including the unsettling event of the Boston Marathon bombing, she remained undeterred in her passion for running, continuously participating in 5Ks and half marathons. Her daughter Dawn recalled Carol's determination and love for life, marking her as an indomitable spirit who stood strong against fear, a quality that resonated deeply with those she encountered. Her life, though ended in a mystery, left an enduring mark of love, resilience, and community spirit. On June 21, 2013, the Gloucester Township community felt a ripple of concern. Carol Reif, a resident, had vanished, seemingly out of thin air. The last anyone heard from Carol was the previous evening, Thursday, June 20th. She'd been in touch with her family, discussing her plans for the following day. It was nothing out of the ordinary, just a routine trip she had planned to make to Manahawkin the next morning to visit her close-knit family. You could imagine the anxiety, the rising sense of panic, when Friday morning came and Carol didn't show up as expected. The clock ticked by. 
hours seemed like eons until her worried family couldn't take it anymore. Trusting their instincts that something was amiss, they reached out to the Gloucester Township Police for assistance. With the information they had, the police officers made their way to Carol's residence, the Lakeview Apartments. A place that should have been a sanctuary, a safe haven, but instead, it was the epicenter of a mystery. A quick sweep of the area showed Carol's car standing still and silent in the parking lot. One can only imagine the chilling feeling the officers might have felt at that sight. The car's presence indicated that Carol hadn't left her home that day for her intended trip. But then, where was she? Adding to the mystery, upon entering her apartment, they found Carol's keys. But Carol was nowhere to be found. It was like she had simply vanished, leaving behind only traces of her everyday life. Days went by, and with each passing moment, the community's collective sense of unease deepened. Neighbors whispered, friends and family held on to hope, and the police continued their search, hoping for a lead or a clue to explain Carol's sudden disappearance. But on June 24, 2013, the investigation took a dark turn. Tucked away in a quiet, wooded area behind an old maintenance building off Lower Landing Road, a discovery was made. It wasn't a piece of evidence or a clue pointing to Carol's whereabouts. It was Carol herself. Detectives, likely with heavy hearts, found the remains of Carol Rife. The vibrant spirit that Carol once embodied, her laughter, her kindness, her dreams, had been cruelly silenced. The discovery not only left a void in the hearts of those who knew her, but also posed a myriad of questions. How did she end up there? What series of events led to her being in that secluded spot? And most pressing of all, what really happened to Carol Reif on that fateful summer day? As news of Carol Reif's discovery spread, the police promptly commenced their investigation. The first step, speaking to residents of the area, and asking for any information related to Carol Reif's disappearance. In a community that prided itself on close connections and neighborly bonds, the hope was that someone might have seen something, anything, that could help piece the puzzle together. During these early stages of the investigation, there was a brief moment of optimism. Detectives, through their diligent efforts, found potential DNA evidence. They collected samples from a pair of genes that belonged to Carol. Additionally, in a twist that made everyone hope for a breakthrough, they also found an empty beer bottle within her apartment, which they believed could hold vital clues. Both hopes were quickly dashed. The DNA tests on both the genes and the beer bottle came back inconclusive. No significant leads. No suspects. Just more questions. Barbara Vecchio, a neighbor, and presumably one of the many interviewed, voiced her concern and disbelief, saying, I truly believe it was a homicide. A woman goes missing for three days? They even had search dogs out here, and still nothing made sense. Jason Laughlin from the Camden County Prosecutor's Office echoed a similar sentiment. He mentioned, From what we observed at the scene and considering the condition in which Carol's body was found, it strongly suggests that a crime might have taken place here. In a bid to get more eyes and ears on the case, Chief Harry Earl of the Gloucester Township Police urged the community to come forward with any information, no matter how insignificant it might seem. Even if you think it's trivial, we want to hear from you, 
he emphasized. To further incentivize individuals with information to come forward, the Citizens Crime Commission announced a reward of $1,000 for any leads on how Carol met her end. It was also shared that Carol's family was in the process of increasing the reward amount, a testament to their unwavering commitment to finding justice for their loved one. Ultimately, based on the evidence at hand and the circumstances surrounding Carol's disappearance, authorities declared her fate as a result of a homicide. But the exact nature and sequence of events leading to her death remained clouded in mystery. Modern technology of the time fell short in offering clarity. The medical examiner faced difficulties in determining the cause of death, further compounding the challenges faced by investigators. As the days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the trail grew cold for a decade. Fast forward to May 2023. The Carol Reif investigation, which had remained stagnant for years, suddenly showed signs of movement. Detectives handling the case hinted at promising leads that had surfaced. Though a decade had passed since Carol's untimely death, the investigative team from Camden County and Gloucester Township never truly set the case aside. Their dedication to finding the person or persons responsible was unwavering. One might wonder, what kept the hope alive after so many years? The answer, in part, lay in the rapid advances in forensic technology. The very same DNA evidence, which had once proved inconclusive, was now being subjected to state-of-the-art testing methods. Detective Jankowski, one of the key figures on the case, conveyed his renewed optimism. We're genuinely hopeful, he stated, that we'll make significant progress soon and bring so much needed justice for Carol and her family. Jankowski also reiterated the continued importance of the community's involvement. Even after nearly 10 years, any piece of information, no matter how small, could prove pivotal in moving the case forward. And indeed, it seemed the community's patience and the investigators' perseverance were about to pay off. As the investigation progressed, attention turned to an individual named Joseph Grissoff, who worked in maintenance and resided close to Carol's apartment. In earlier interactions with police, Grissoff had mentioned seeing Carol and even complimenting her on occasion. However, he firmly denied ever setting foot inside her residence. Now, remember the DNA evidence from Carol's jeans and that empty beer bottle from her apartment. Though the initial test years ago had been inconclusive, the technological advancements of the last decade brought new possibilities. And when the evidence was retested, there was a revelation. The DNA found matched Grissoff's. The community of Gloucester Township, which had been anxiously awaiting any news about the beloved mother and friend's case, was buzzing. This development, a potential breakthrough in a case that had long gone cold, provided a renewed sense of hope. Though many questions still remained, this significant lead felt like the first step towards closure for Carol's grieving family and friends. With the newfound evidence, the pursuit of justice for Carol Reef gained momentum. As the pieces of the puzzle began to fit together, it was evident that the collective efforts of law enforcement, paired with advancements in technology and an ever-watchful community, were bringing the truth to light. Born March 1, 1964, in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, Joseph Grissoff's past remains largely unknown. What we do know is that by the time of Carol Reef's tragic demise, Grissoff was known in the Gloucester Township's community as a simple maintenance worker 
residing near Carol's apartment. The upbringing and family life of Joseph Grissoff are scant in the public record. Did the tranquility of Mount Laurel, his birthplace, have any influence on the man he became? It's hard to say. His connection to Carol initially seemed coincidental due to their proximity. However, it would turn out to be much more sinister. Little is known about Grissoff's childhood behaviors, education, or even if he was ever married. Like many in the community, he seemed to keep to himself, going about his daily tasks, blending into the background. His job as a maintenance worker put him in close contact with many of the residents, giving him access and insights that few others had. Yet he maintained a quiet, unassuming presence drawing no undue attention. Though it's challenging to paint a complete picture of Joseph Grissoff without more concrete details about his life, it's worth noting that sometimes the most dangerous individuals are those who manage to stay hidden in plain sight, their dark secrets obscured by the mundane nature of their daily lives. The revelation of Grissoff's DNA match to the evidence found in Carol's apartment was a seismic shock to many who thought they knew him. It remains uncertain whether his alleged involvement in Carol's death was an isolated incident or the latest in a series of sinister acts. However, what was clear is that the community's trust was broken. In a significant development in the Carol Rife Cold case of 2023, Joseph Grissoff found himself at the center of law enforcement's focus. On May 10th, 2023, a Wednesday that the Gloucester Township community will long remember, prosecutors made their move. Joseph Grissoff was officially arrested in Morristown by the U.S. Marshals Service New York, New Jersey Regional Fugitive Task Force, Camden Division and charged with the first-degree murder of Carol Reef. This marked a monumental step towards justice for Carol and her grieving family. With DNA evidence pointing squarely at Grissoff and the weight of the community's desire for answers pressing down, the stage was set for what promised to be a highly-watched trial. While the exact trial date remains undetermined, One thing is certain. The community, Carol's family, and all those who had followed this decade-long mystery would be watching closely, hoping for clarity and justice in this heart-wrenching case. The long journey seeking justice for Carol Reef was nearing its end. With developments in the case, Carol's family finally saw a glimmer of closure. Their unwavering determination to ensure the perpetrator faced the consequences of his actions was evident. Camden County Prosecutor Grace McCauley voiced her gratitude and admiration for the team behind the investigation, stating, I'm deeply appreciative of the detectives and assistant prosecutors who stood steadfast in their pursuit of justice for Miss Reef. Their commitment has been instrumental in holding accountable the individual who cruelly took her away from her family and community. Though strides have been made, the investigation continues. Authorities still urge the public to come forward with any additional information. Detective Jeremy Jankowski of the Camden County Prosecutor's Office Homicide Unit at 856-397-3485 and Detective Michael Leach of the Gloucester Township Police Department at 856-228-4500 are the points of contact for anyone with information related to the case. While the legal proceedings move forward, the community, united in their grief and quest for justice, continues to support Carol's family. As they inch closer to a resolution, the hope remains that Carol's loved ones can find some semblance of peace. What do you think about Grissoff taking Carol's life all of a sudden? 
How do you feel about the decades-long journey towards justice? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. If there's another case you're curious about, drop your recommendations in the comment section below. It's one of the coldest cases ever to be solved by genetic genealogy, the 1930 kidnapping of a Chicago toddler. Target 8 investigator Susan Samples reports it was a West Michigan woman, a very distant relative of the kidnapped girl who found the key. May 15, 1930. A two-year-old girl called Mary Agnes Maroney was taken from her South Side home, leaving the nation wondering. What happened to Mary Agnes? This intriguing mystery puzzled detectives and troubled the Maroney family for nearly a century. However, advancements in technology led to answers that had escaped generations in 2023. We will explore the epic story of Mary Agnes Maroney, a child taken from her family, and the shocking discoveries that followed. This is the tale of optimism and determination in discovering the truth. We will solve the century-old mystery to find closure and gain understanding. Why would anyone take someone's child away? Let's get into it. Chicago, with its skyscrapers and turbulent past, retains the ghosts of past ages. During the early 1930s, Chicago's skyline demonstrated the impacts of the Great Depression. On the south side, a range of neighborhoods contained both remarkable architecture and areas grappling with economic hardship. Chicagoans formed close-knit communities amid the skyscrapers, taking comfort in one another during financial upheaval. The bustling south side streets told stories of courage in the face of hardship. The mystery of Mary Agnes Maroney began against this vivid backdrop, reverberating across Chicago and the nation. Mary Agnes Maroney's story touched Chicagoans and others as the city struggled. In the spring of 1928, against the backdrop of a nation facing economic upheaval and societal change, Mary Agnes Maroney was born. She was a lovely two-year-old who was born in Chicago on May 10th. In their poor home at 5200 Wentworth Avenue on the city's south side, Michael and Catherine Maroney welcomed their first of two daughters. Michael, who worked hard for $15 a week distributing handbills, and Catherine, a loving mother, were among the many families struggling with the Great Depression. Born into poverty and financial insecurity, Mary Agnes symbolized innocence and her parents' ambitions. Her younger sister, Anastasia, 11 months old when Mary Agnes was born, added love and optimism to their family more than ever. Nobody knew that Mary Agnes was destined to play a role in an enigmatic tale that would captivate the nation and leave a legacy that would be revealed in the early 21st century. The disappearance of two-year-old Mary Agnes Maroney from her Chicago, Illinois home on May 15, 1930 has haunted investigators and the public for almost a century. It all started when a scheming woman appeared at the Maroney home at 5200 Wentworth Avenue on Chicago's South Side on May 15, 1930. She identified herself as Julia Otis, a social worker, sent to help the Maronis. She was a 22-year-old well-dressed woman with prominent teeth and a refined voice. After Catherine Maroney, Mary Agnes's mother, let Julia Otis in, they were deceived, and their lives changed forever. The family needed help making ends meet. While Catherine confessed about her financial situation, Julia Otis provided optimism to Catherine's family. 
Julia advised Catherine to temporarily take Mary Agnes to California, promising to return the infant unrecognizable and fat as a butterball. Also, Julia gave them two dollars to help them immediately. Catherine reluctantly but desperately let Julia Otis take Mary Agnes, feeling she was doing the best for her child. She didn't realize this decision would break her family. Julia Otis came to the Maronis the next day, carrying baby clothes because Catherine was pregnant again. Julia convinced Catherine to go by promising to get Michael Maroney a better job and buying Mary Agnes new clothes and shoes. Despite Mary Agnes's protests and sobs, the child was carried away, never to be seen again. After Mary Agnes disappeared, Julia Otis sent the Maronis her first mysterious letter. The letter said, Don't worry, I'm taking your daughter to California. I hired a special nurse for her. We'll return in two months. You will recover and be able to care for her. Her tears were non-existent. Princess like a tire. I'll assist you in getting up in the meantime. Do not worry about her or anything else. Upon receipt of this letter, we'll go. As usual, Julia Otis. Although reassuring, this letter gave little hope to the Maroney family members from the woman who took their child. Another letter arrived two weeks later. The author identified herself as Alice Henderson, claiming to be Julie Otis's cousin. In the letter, Henderson explained that Otis was love-hungry after losing her husband and baby the year before. This argument made sense to a desperate family during the Great Depression. This letter, like the one before it, was the Maroney family's final hope from the woman who had abducted their child. The family spent decades searching for Mary Agnes, but they kept getting false leads. Mary Agnes Maroney's disappearance became one of the oldest, most perplexing, and frightening cold cases in criminal history. Mary Agnes Maroney's disappearance was investigated shortly after her abduction in 1930, with a series of leads and probable sightings that left detectives and the Maroney family dubious. Early on in the urgent search for the lost youngster, several crucial things occurred. After the tragic disappearance, the Maroney family held on to every scrap of hope. Leads appeared, but cruelly faded, leaving them to worry about their daughter's destiny. Martha Thompson, a Native American woman hauling a cart to a circus, gave hope in July 1931. Authorities saw the three-year-old daughter she cared for, who had Mary Agnes's beautiful blue eyes and blonde hair. Investigators met Martha Thompson, an elderly woman, in July of 1931. Her cart had a three-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl who matched Mary Agnes's description. Martha Thompson begged to keep the kid, claiming that a woman named Florence Fuller had abandoned her. Mary Agnes was not identified by the Maroney family as the cart girl. This incident complicated the investigation leaving detectives with more questions than answers. Over two decades after Mary Agnes's abduction, a breakthrough occurred in 1952. After seeing Mary Agnes's siblings' photo, 24-year-old homemaker Mary McClelland claimed she was the lost girl. Within a year of her captivity, Charles and Nora Beck adopted McClellan. Dr. Krause, a medical expert, matched her tooth castings to the Maroney families. Her skull and blood also suggested McClellan was a Maroney. Her mother said she recognized her. The identity of Mary Agnes appeared possible. However, an aging physician named Dr. E. W. Marithu 
informed the investigation that McClelland was handed over to an unknown mother on November 17, 1927, and her mother provided a 1928 baby picture of her daughter, suggesting she had been adopted two years prior to Mary Agnes's disappearance. McClelland did not have a ruptured navel scar like Mary Agnes. Further DNA testing revealed that Mary McClellan was not Mary Agnes Moroni, ending the case again. Early investigations with intriguing leads and heartbreaking near misses produced more questions than they answered, leaving the Moroni family in constant misery. What happened to Mary Agnes Moroni in the early days of her disappearance would puzzle the investigators and worried the family for decades. The Mary Agnes Moroni case, which had been unresolved for over a century, gained unexpected momentum in 2023. Mary Agnes's disappearance was a difficult case for Cook County Sheriff's Office Detective Jose Rodriguez. His dedicated and technological advances illuminated the case. Detective Rodriguez began reviving this cold case by searching dusty archives for earlier police reports. An internet forum where a Moroni family member identified themselves was his breakthrough. This digital connection started a transformational research journey. The fact that some Moroni family members had used websites including Ancestry and 23andMe changed this investigation. These services to trace ancestry and family relationships provided a new insight into this case. It was fortunate that they were able to find an unknown Moroni relative in the database by taking advantage of these services. The granddaughter of Jeanette Burchard, Lori Hart, was important to this revival of hope. Lori identified as a Moroni second or third cousin via DNA research. This breakthrough genetic relationship between the Burchards and Moronis was significant. It raised the possibility that Mary Agnes, who disappeared in 1930, was living as Jeanette Burchard for decades. This revitalized inquiry went beyond forensic analysis and it turned out Mary Agnes lived as Jeanette Burchard. It gave the Moroni family closure and a glimpse of the truth they had sought for generations. After years of doubt and sorrow, the discovery that Mary Agnes had lived a good life of love and happiness was a great comfort. This melancholy moment allowed individuals who had held this mystery to honor a fallen family member. The identification of Jeanette Burchard as Mary Agnes also distinguished this case from others. In the past, promising leads and identifications were disproved by DNA testing. However, DNA evidence aligned this time, supporting the two families' shared family link. Despite this astonishing breakthrough and its convincing evidence, the case remains unsolved by the law. The Cook County authorities proved Jeanette Burchard was Mary Agnes. To confirm this, they exhumed Jeanette Burchard and Mary Agnes's mother, Catherine. DNA extraction from exhumed remains is a delicate process. All parties must carefully consider and consent. Jeanette Burchard's daughter, Lori Arnold, opposes such a drastic move. Exhumation could lead to confirmation, but it would also bring up many emotions and questions for families and the community. A mystery remains about Julia Otis, the woman who disappeared at the Moroni family's doorway in 1930, starting this tragedy. What got Julia Otis involved in this case? And why? She or others are responsible for Mary Agnes's disappearance. But how Mary Agnes was nurtured by the Burchards is also puzzling. Her life's missing links and how she became Jeanette Burchard 
a lady who lived under an assumed identity for decades, are unknown. Mary Agnes Maroney's case may remain unsolved legally, but the reunification of two families and the revelations about her life as Jeanette Burchard has brought some peace to those who have carried it for nearly a century. This reinvestigation shows the power of current forensic science and the strength of family relationships and the persistent drive to find the truth, even in the oldest and most disturbing cold cases. It's a tale of tenacity and the irrepressible human spirit that drives people to find answers, regardless of time. Mary Agnes Maroney may remain elusive, but her legacy lives on in those who never gave up on her. Despite discoveries and painful reunions, the Mary Agnes Maroney case remains challenging. The discovery that Mary Agnes may have lived a fulfilling life as Jeanette Burchard gave the Maroney family some closure after decades of grief. The fact that she was surrounded by love, happiness, and family brought great closure to those who had sought answers. This new relationship between the Maroney and Burchard families showed the power of family. Even when hidden for decades, blood links could unite distant cousins. It showed that time cannot erase family. Legal closure of the matter is still elusive. Jeanette Burchard and Mary Agnes's mother, Catherine, must be exhumed to gather DNA evidence. This step is technically possible, but ethically and emotionally difficult. Julia Otis's role in Mary Agnes's disappearance and how she became Jeanette Burchard may never be known. Enigmas complicate the case's resolution leaving some parts of the story unresolved. Mary Agnes Maroney's narrative spans over a century of pain, questions, and new connections. While the issue is unsolved legally, it is resolved in the hearts of those affected. Mary Agnes has enjoyed a life full of love and family, ending the generations-old mystery. This touching story of rediscovery and reconciliation spanning decades and reuniting distant cousins shows that family can illuminate the long search for truth and resolution, even in the oldest cold cases. We're looking into a cold case that spanned three states and more than 25 years. It began when a woman disappeared in St. Francis back in 1997. She was noted as last having worn that purple sweater and jeans. Well, the purple sweater is what we have. It definitely had been in the elements between the water and the sand and the dirt. The report says that on October 2nd, 1997, St. Francis police got called for a suspicious person here off Lake Drive. Determined investigators and new DNA technology finally helped identify Jane Doe. In the annals of unsolved mysteries, the case of the unidentified lady stood as a haunting enigma for over two decades. The year was 1997 when tragedy struck the serene shores of Lake Michigan, leaving an indelible mark on the quaint neighborhood of Manistee County. On October 27th, the lifeless body of a young woman adorned with only a single earring, washed up in the 4,000 block of Fox Farm Road, a place known for its peaceful vistas. Little did anyone know that this discovery would spark a relentless quest for answers, spanning years of detective work and the remarkable advancements of DNA analysis. The identity of this mysterious lady, concealed for so long, would finally be unveiled providing her family with the closure they had yearned for. How did a young woman's life end in a peaceful haven of Manistee County, only to remain a mystery for a staggering 25 years? What unforeseen twists of fate and advancements in science would finally unveil the identity of the lady by the shores of Lake Michigan? Let's find out. In 
the serene backdrop of Lake Michigan's shores, a chilling mystery lay hidden for over 25 years. Join us as we uncover the enigmatic tales of the nameless lady, whose life and tragic demise by the lake's edge have long perplexed investigators. Natural beauty captivates the Great Lakes Michigan shoreline. It follows Lake Michigan's eastern border for about 3,000 miles. The wide seashore offers beautiful landscapes and many experiences. Sunbathers and beachcombers can enjoy the sun's warmth on sandy beaches for miles. Large sand dunes, some exceeding 450 feet tall, produce breathtaking views. Beyond the beaches, beautiful greenery and hiking paths make it a nature lover's haven. Each season brings its own appeal to Michigan's shores. Summers are full of family sandcastle construction and water sports. Hikers and leaf peepers flock to the forests as autumn foliage turns flaming. Ice formations along the shore offer a frozen beauty in winter. Spring brings migratory birds and wildflowers, bringing rejuvenation. Locals and tourists have long loved this lively region, rich in natural beauty and cultural legacy, as a peaceful respite from the outside world. On October 27, 1997, a peaceful Lake Michigan neighborhood was shaken by a terrifying discovery that lasted for years. In the 4,000 block of Fox Farm Road, where the lake's waters lapped against the beach, an unpleasant event changed the neighborhood's sense of calm. This lovely spot in Manistee County had long been a refuge from the world. With its beautiful beaches and stunning views of Lake Michigan, residents and visitors enjoyed the natural beauty. The neighborhood's residents were serenaded by birdsong and leaf rustling. But on that fateful day in 1997, peace was broken. The corpse of a young woman, bare except for an earring, washed up from the water like a macabre offering. The neighborhood was used to the peaceful water flow, but on that fateful day, a terrifying mystery abruptly emerged. Even in death, the woman's presence contrasted with the quiet neighborhood she had joined. She was a sad mystery from Lake Michigan who was unknown to the residents. Her lifeless body, unclothed, saw an unimaginable catastrophe. Residents were shocked after hearing this tragic revelation. Once soothing, their surroundings now felt frightening and unpredictable. How did this young woman die in their midst? What had brought her to Lake Michigan and left her so desolate? Authorities were tasked with solving the mystery. The lone earring was all that was left to identify the deceased, leaving detectives perplexed and the town disturbed by the mystery. As the years passed, the neighborhood story of the unidentified woman took on an eerie hue. Her haunting memories served as a chilling reminder of life's delicate balance and the ever-present shadow of the unknown. The enigma of her unresolved fate cast a permanent shadow over the once tranquil Michigan shoreline its mysteries echoing through time, beckoning for answers that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The early inquiry into the death of this lady whose body washed up on Lake Michigan's tranquil shores was plagued by questions and a lack of leads. The community struggled to understand the unpleasant enigma, so law enforcement investigators sought the truth. Local officials immediately began investigating the death. With only the lone earring to identify the corpse, detectives had to piece together her life and death. 
The initial autopsy on the corpse's remains revealed her death's cause. She drowned and died of suffocation. This sad discovery illuminated her death and generated additional concerns about the events leading up to it. Her drowning was still unknown after the autopsy. How did an unclothed young woman die in Lake Michigan? Was there foul play? Or a terrible accident? These issues gnawed at the community's conscience, and the search for solutions intensified. The case was puzzling because there were no leads to identify or explain her death. Her naked body gave no apparent clues, and no missing person reports fit her description. She was like a ghost that had emerged from the lake, leaving no sign of her identity or how she had met her end. Victim identification was the first big challenge in the inquiry. It was nearly hard to solve the puzzle without a name. Authorities searched neighboring states and law enforcement agencies for leads. However, for a painful time, their attempts failed. In September of 2020, after 23 long years since she was found, MSP Cadillac Post and MSP Missing Persons Coordination Unit detectives reopened the case in hopes of solving the two-decade-old mystery. Exhuming remains for advanced DNA testing was a major breakthrough in the revived inquiry. This vital step helped to identify the victim and revealed her untimely death. Under the DNA Doe Project for Forensic Genetic Genealogy, Astria Forensics received her bone samples. The exhumation of her remains was a major case development but it also underscored the problems ahead. The degraded bone samples made standard DNA testing useless. The search for answers struck another hurdle, requiring creative solutions. Despite obstacles, the research continued. Forensic genetic genealogy revealed a possible familial match in July of 2021, leading investigators to the Thing family in Acton, Maine. Investigative genetic genealogy helped the DNA Doe Project identify the dead. The York County Sheriff's Office in Maine helped gather DNA reference samples from a possible brother. Authorities obtained familial DNA reference samples from a possible daughter to learn her identity. The 1997 Milwaukee Journal Sentinel articles revealed her contacts before her disappearance, aiding the DNA Doe Project's careful work. Due to bone sample degradation, the identity of the lady required additional DNA testing. After standard testing failed, bone samples were sent to Intermountain Forensics in Salt Lake City, Utah, for advanced next-generation sequencing or NGS, to identify them. The remains were identified by the DNA Diagnostic Center, or DDC, and Intermountain Forensics in December of 2022, after two decades of searching. The victim, last seen in Wisconsin on October 2, 1997, by 12.30 p.m., was given her name back. Her name was found to be Dorothy Lynn Ricker. Dorothy Ricker's case began with frustration, confusion, and little leads. The mysterious presence of an unnamed woman tormented the community and investigators, reminding them of the secrets that can lie in even the most peaceful places. Dorothy Lynn Ricker was born in Chicago a bustling city with boundless potential. Like a canvas, her life was ready to be painted, with dreams and experiences. She was on the edge of adulthood at 26, when most individuals are navigating life's unknown. In the fall of 1997, 
Lynn's life took an unexpected turn to Lake Michigan's gorgeous shoreline. The disappearance and finding of this young woman puzzled detectives for years, revealing her awful destiny. A case that had perplexed police and plagued a town for over two decades was resolved when Dorothy Lynn Ricker was positively identified. After her name was revealed, the inquiry into her terrible death began to uncover the causes and bring closure to her family. After Dorothy's identity was disclosed, law enforcement and investigative teams worked together to solve her life's mysteries and determine what happened on Lake Michigan that tragic day. The next steps would involve researching her background, retracing her final days, and looking for leads to explain her awful demise. After confirming Dorothy Ricker's identification, investigators focused on reconstructing her disappearance and drowning. To do this, they searched historical archives, spoke to people who had seen her in the days before her disappearance, and revisited her haunts. One important piece of information was a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel article from October 7, 1997, five days after Dorothy's final encounter. Dorothy's disappearance timeline was revealed in the article. After she disappeared, St. Francis boaters reported a body in the lake, but it vanished before officials could find it. This disturbing information sparked doubts about Dorothy's anguish or foul play before drowning. Dorothy ran out of petrol on Thursday, October 2, 1997, and a Waukesha County Sheriff's deputy gave her a ride and $10 for gas. As investigators dug into her disappearance, these ordinary exchanges gained importance. In addition to reviewing media articles, investigators sought to find individuals who had contact with Dorothy in her final days. These connections could reveal her mood, purpose, and whether she had encountered any threats or suspects. The 1997 Milwaukee Journal Sentinel articles placed Dorothy near Lake Michigan just before her abduction, which helped. She appeared to be enjoying the lakeside and sun on that fateful day, suggesting a peaceful moment before disaster. Dorothy's headstone confirmed a likely death date many weeks before her body was found in Michigan, providing an intriguing lead. In the search for answers, the headstone suggested a grieving family seeking closure. The identification of Dorothy Ricker and the case's developments had a significant impact on both her family and the community. Dorothy's daughter, who lived in Chicago, was emotional when she learned her mother's identity. Her mother's fate was confirmed, but it also reopened scars that had been raw for almost two decades. The Thing family in Acton, Maine, struggled with the fact that their relative was Dorothy, who had washed up in Michigan. Since Dorothy's abduction, they had lived with anguish and unanswered questions. The sad finding in Manistee County brought closure and relief. The woman who had tormented their quiet neighborhood for years was eventually revealed, and their area's riddle was solved. After identifying Dorothy Ricker and revisiting her last days, detectives now had to determine the circumstances of her drowning. The first autopsy deemed her death an accident by suffocation due to drowning. But her lake immersion led to doubts. The investigation determined if Dorothy's drowning was accidental or if foul play contributed to her death. Forensic analysis, witness interviews, and evidence review are needed to find the truth. As the Dorothy Lynn Ricker investigation progressed, law enforcement forensic experts and investigative teams were committed to seeking justice for a young woman 
who had been mercilessly killed. The future held further disclosures and the possibility of answers that might ultimately solve a decades-old mystery, bringing consolation to her family and the town that had been forever changed by her presence on Lake Michigan. On October 2, 1997, 12.30 p.m., Dorothy's life changed mysteriously. She was last spotted on a Lake Michigan beach bench in St. Francis, Wisconsin. The cops who briefly spoke with her found nothing unusual. She was from Chicago and enjoying the lakefront and the sun. She had not yet been reported missing, and the world saw her as another beachgoer enjoying the scenery. Within two days, her vehicle was found abandoned near where she sat. Dorothy's life had taken an unexpected turn, and her disappearance raised concerns. The identification of Dorothy Lynn Ricker and the accompanying investigation into her death affected her family and the community. The Chicago-based daughter's confirmation of her mother's identity offered closure and emotional renewal. Her mother's destiny had finally been decided, but it rekindled her sorrow and caused new grief. The Thing family in Acton, Maine, struggled with the news that Dorothy was the unnamed woman found on Lake Michigan. The discovery brought back memories of the anxiety and unsolved questions that had plagued them for over two decades. Dorothy's lifeless body washed up in 1997 in beautiful Manistee County, bringing closure. The neighborhood's long-standing mystery was lifted when the intriguing figure was revealed. Dorothy's identification initially brought solace and clarity but her awful destiny continued to haunt everyone touched by her story. As the investigation into her drowning continued, more disclosures and justice were possible. The Dorothy Lynn Ricker case was still open, but with each step it got closer to the truth, bringing hope to people whose lives had been forever changed by this decades-old mystery on Lake Michigan. The identification of Dorothy Lynn Ricker ended a 25-year mystery for her family and community. Her daughter in Chicago was relieved and sad to learn her mother's fate. The Thing family in Acton, Maine learned that their relative was the unnamed woman on Lake Michigan's shoreline, bringing back bitter memories. In Manistee County, the community could now identify the mysterious woman in their history. This revelation brought closure to Dorothy Lynn Ricker's identity, but it did not remove the tragedy. Although many doubts remained, the search for the truth had begun, promising closure and justice. Dorothy Lynn Ricker's lifeless body washed up on Lake Michigan's peaceful shores, demonstrating forensic science and detectives' persistence. Since her name is known, we wonder what killed her and what secrets lie beneath the waves. Dorothy's story encourages tenacity and mystery solving. Dorothy Lynn Ricker's tale ends with two questions. What other historical mysteries can forensic science and dedicated detectives solve? How many more unknown people are buried in unmarked graves, their stories lost to time? awaiting identification and closure. Life was filled with challenges right up to the moment he took his last breaths outside an Akron church. They think he wasn't important enough. I'm not gonna lie, I have times where I feel like, well, if he was a Caucasian, you know, a heterosexual male, they would have looked harder. They would have found something. When he dressed up as Egypt, he was Egypt. When he was Brian, he was Brian. When a single bullet pierced through his thighs, just outside this Akron church. On June 13th, 2020, near the hallowed halls of the University of Akron, a gunshot shattered the stillness, forever altering his tale. 
as his family and friends grappled with the shock and grief of his untimely death, they were met with frustration and despair. They couldn't help but wonder if Brian's identity as a transgender individual played a role in the sluggish progress of the investigation. However, in March 2023, a glimmer of hope arose when authorities apprehended a suspect. As we get into the details of this tale, two questions emerged. What series of events led to the apprehension of a suspect in Brian's case and what dark secrets might they hold? What could have been the motive behind Brian's untimely death and how deep does this web of mystery truly go? Our journey takes us to Akron, Ohio, the state's fifth largest city. Akron is a place known for its close-knit neighborhoods and a laid-back vibe that defines its community spirit. Yet beneath this surface tranquility, there's a stark reality. A high crime rate with a staggering 43 incidents per 1,000 residents. This rate stands as one of the highest in the nation where the chances of falling victim to a crime, be it violent or property-related, is 1 in 23. On the fateful day of June 13, 2020, Akron's serene setting was once again shattered. The shocking crime that unfolded left its residents in disbelief, as 43-year-old Brian Joseph Powers was found lifeless on the street. On April 11, 1977, Walter Powers and Veronica Freemuth welcomed their son Brian Joseph Powers into the world. Brian would go on to make a lasting impact on Akron's LGBTQ community. He had two siblings, a brother named Walter Powers and a sister named Vivian Powers Smith. Growing up, Brian was unique. He didn't conform to traditional gender roles. He loved My Little Pony more than Tonka Trucks and dreamed of dancing back up for famous singers like Janet Jackson and Paula Abdul. Brian attended McCabright Elementary and two other high schools during his school days. As he grew older, Brian discovered a passion for cooking and found success working with his friends Harristine Price at her catering company. Being a black transgender man in South Akron during the 70s and 80s was challenging. But Brian, affectionately known as Egypt to his friends, never let it dim his sparkle. Powers also had aspirations to start his own t-shirt company. He also got sober after struggling with substance abuse during his younger years. His journey was steadily bringing him closer to the realization of his dream for stability. He had a love for old movies, a contagious laugh, and his signature unicorn braids, which proudly displayed different shades of the rainbow. If you would have met him, you would have loved him, said Vivian Powers Smith. Brian's good heart and unapologetic authenticity shone brightly despite the challenges he faced. He used he-him pronouns, but sometimes went by Egypt. In the words of those who knew him, when he was Brian, he was gorgeous, six foot two, just a beautiful man. On June 12, 2020, Brian Powers visited his friend Carletta's house, a usual weekend gathering. They shared laughs, jokes, and even a playful announcement from Brian that he was pregnant, causing bursts of laughter among his friends. What began as a typical get-together took a terrifying turn. Brian bid farewell to his friends around 8 p.m. and headed home. However, a grim discovery was made the next morning, June 13, 2020, just 12 hours later shortly before 8 a.m. A groundskeeper stumbled upon Brian's lifeless body, covered in blood, lying on the sidewalk outside the chapel church downtown Akron. Power's dream of stability and brighter days 
were abruptly cut short. It wasn't long before the groundskeeper involved the police, who launched an investigation to unravel the unsettling events surrounding Brian Powers' tragic end. The questions loomed. Who could have committed such a heinous act? And why? When the Akron Police Department was alerted, they rushed to the sidewalk near East Butchell Avenue and Chapel Drive, where Brian's lifeless body lay face up. A thorough search of the area yielded little evidence except for a nearby cell phone. There were no signs of a struggle, no bullets, and no shell casings that could aid the detectives in identifying a suspect. Faced with this perplexing scene, the police sent Brian's body for an autopsy, hoping for some crucial answers. The medical examiner's office revealed that Brian had tragically died from a single bullet that had passed through both of his thighs. He had managed to walk about a hundred yards before collapsing right in front of the chapel church. Brian, who had a deep spiritual connection, met his untimely end right by the church, a place where he believed God's love transcended his physical identity. Unfortunately, the exact time of his death remained unconfirmed, but the cell phone recovered from the crime scene helped narrow it down. As the investigation into Brian's death unfolded, detectives found themselves with more questions than answers. Who had taken Brian's life and why? To unearth the truth, they turned to Brian's family and friends. Vivian Powers Smith, Brian's sister, revealed that on the night before his death, Brian had attended a party and was walking home dressed as his persona Egypt in feminine clothing. She believed that Brian might have fallen victim to a hate crime. Carlton Amos, a close friend of Brian, was devastated by the news of Brian's death. Just a week prior, they had shared their dreams celebrating Brian's seven months of sobriety and newfound stability. Brian was filled with optimism, wanting to start a t-shirt company. Carlton couldn't fathom losing his friends so suddenly. Brian had often spoken of a violent fate, a notion others had dismissed, but now it felt chillingly real. Brian was a charismatic and fiercely self-defensive person, known for making deep connections in mere minutes. He had the power to draw people towards him with an irresistible force, but at times he could also spark grudges. At his memorial service on June 21, 2020, an African-American gay man shared a heartwarming story of how Brian had come to his rescue from a predatory man at the transit center leading to an unexpected friendship. This encounter highlighted Brian's unyielding sense of justice and his willingness to fight for his rights and the rights of others. The police had a hunch that Brian's untimely demise was linked to a conflict with someone, possibly an act of revenge from a previous altercation. However, with no apparent signs of struggle at the crime scene, they faced the daunting challenge of piecing together the events leading to Brian's tragic end. For Brian's sister, Vivian Power Smith, the journey to find answers had been agonizing. It's been a little torturous, she said, this process, and because of the way he was taken. The search for answers in Brian Power's case continued but it led to frustrating dead ends. His friends and family, growing increasingly despondent, believed that his gender and race hindered the pace of the investigation. They felt that the case wasn't receiving the attention and resources it deserved from law enforcement. Vivian, Brian's sister, found it inconceivable that no witness had come forward, despite the incident occurring in a public place. She lamented, I would think someone you know would know something, but nobody's saying anything. 
The police say they have no leads. Desperate for answers and justice, Brian's family decided to take matters into their own hands. They created a GoFundMe page to raise reward money, hoping that this would incentivize someone to come forward with information about Brian's untimely death. Every dollar donated fueled their hope that a breakthrough would eventually come. Despite their relentless efforts, the investigation remained at a frustrating standstill. The family was left to grapple with the agonizing uncertainty of whether they would ever find the closure they so desperately sought. Vivian Powers emphasized the importance of keeping Brian's memory alive, not just as a murder victim, but as a good person, a brother, a son, an uncle, and a friend. He mattered, his life mattered to the people who loved him. Here we ask you as a society, how can we better support families like Brian's, who are left to navigate the painful aftermath of such crimes? The death of Brian left his family deeply suspicious of foul play, and their suspicions were further heightened when Vivian, Brian's sister, disclosed a violent altercation that had occurred just a week before his tragic demise. According to Vivian, Brian had been confronted by two strangers who subjected him to homophobic slurs. In response, Brian had bravely fought back, asserting, I had to show them who I was. Strikingly, the police had not been informed of this incident before it was brought to the media's attention. On August 29, 2020, the community organized a vigil to demand justice for Brian and raise awareness about the alarming increase in hate crimes against the LGBTQ community in Akron. Unfortunately, the police remained unaware of the incident that could have played a role in Brian's death. The family expressed frustration with the inconsistent communication from the detectives. Responding to these concerns, Akron Police Spokesperson Lt. Michael Miller revealed that the case had hit a dead end due to the lack of witnesses coming forward. Nevertheless, the investigative team continued to sift through evidence and pursue leads. He emphasized that Brian's gender identity did not affect the department's commitment to bringing justice to Brian and his family. Despite the challenges, the department remained resolute in its pursuit of the truth and the apprehension of the culprits. Finally, in 2023, after three long years of investigation, a breakthrough occurred. The police identified a strong suspect and made an arrest on the morning of March 9, 2023. The Northern Ohio Violent Fugitive Task Force, in collaboration with local police, located and apprehended Bobby Lee Bell of Cuyahoga Falls along South Arlington Street. Bell's arrest marked the culmination of an extensive investigation that involved gathering evidence, conducting interviews, and following up on tips. Bobby Lee Bell, born in 1975, hails from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Not much is known about his early life or background. However, his criminal history tells a troubling story. Most notably, he served nearly a decade in prison for attempted aggravated murder and aggravated robbery in 1993. Although he was released in 2008, he found himself back behind bars serving additional time for drug trafficking. His criminal past and the serious charges against him underscore the urgency of bringing justice to Brian Powers' case. On March 9, 2023, in a joint effort, the Northern Ohio Violent Fugitive Task Force, working together with local police, successfully tracked down Bobby Lee Bell. They located him on South Arlington Street, where he was taken into custody without any resistance or incident. During Bell's arrest, 
officers discovered a loaded handgun and other incriminating evidence. His list of charges was extensive, including murder, illegal possession of a firearm due to his prior felony convictions, improper handling of a firearm inside a motor vehicle, possession of crack cocaine, and drug paraphernalia. Soon after, Bobby Lee Bell was shifted to Summit County Jail, facing a murder charge. During this development, Akron Police Chief Steve Milet expressed his thoughts, stating, Any loss of life is tragic, and I hope this arrest provided closure for the Powers family and those who knew and cared for him. Our commitment to public safety and helping to make for a stronger Akron remains unchanged. Upon hearing of the arrest, Brian Powers' family grappled with the unsettling mystery surrounding his death. They wondered if prejudice had fueled the killing, questioning the motive behind such a senseless act. Vivian Power Smith, Brian's sister, voiced her concerns, saying, Did you just shoot him because you'd just seen him walking down the street? Or you just felt like hurting somebody because you were angry? I don't know. And it's hard. Did you just shoot him because you just seen him walking down the street? Or because you didn't, you just felt like hurting somebody because you were angry? I, I don't know. And it's hard. However, with Bobby Lee Bell's arrest, there is hope for accountability and justice. Vivian Powers expressed relief saying, at least now we're on the road to having someone take accountability, getting him some justice. And the way I look at it, if this is the person who took my brother, now they can't take nobody else. The motive for the crime still remains unclear, but Brian Powers' family hopes to uncover whether he was targeted because of his identity. They refused to let him be reduced to a mere statistic. Akron Police Spokesperson Lt. Michael Miller also stated that Brian Powers' orientation or gender identity did not impact the department's approach or dedication to the case. He emphasized that investigators are passionate, dedicated, and committed to solving the case with the same diligence and purpose as any other investigation. The department's resolve remains unwavering, driven solely by the goal of finding the truth and delivering justice, regardless of demographics or identity. Lieutenant Miller further added that the department's solve rates with previous homicides reflect their dedication to cases across different demographics. There is no room for bias in their motivation. They are equally committed to solving this case as they would be with any other past or future. As we conclude this exploration of Brian J. Powers' case, we invite you to ponder these questions. What do you think drives acts of prejudice and violence against individuals like Brian Powers in today's society? An unsolved murder has detectives searching for answers eight years later. The case of a young Bronx woman brutally killed, gone cold. Now the anniversary of the day that her body was discovered in Yonkers, her family begging for help to find the killer. The questions that still haunt Tawana McClellan about her baby sister's savage killing. September 4th, 2012, at around 5.35 p.m., a chilling 911 call echoed through the quiet streets of Yonkers, New York. Dispatchers at Yonkers Police Department hastily answered the call, unaware of the horror that awaited them. Within minutes, the Yonkers police descended upon the scene. There, in a secluded grim discovery, the lifeless body of 26-year-old Bronx resident Pamela Graddick lay before them. She had been reported missing a few weeks prior, just two days after she failed to show up for her role as a teacher's assistant. Initially, there were several suspects, and the case hung heavily in the air. But as the days turned into weeks, the case went cold. However, the perseverance and unwavering commitment of the investigators would ultimately yield results nearly a decade later in 2022, when the long sought after breakthrough came. The killer was finally identified, bringing a measure of closure to the tragic saga. 
As we get into the details of this chilling tale, two questions emerge. Who might have caused harm to the young girl, and what could have been their motive? How did Pamela Graddick meet her tragic end, and did justice truly prevail for this young victim? Let's find out. Our case takes us to the northernmost borough of New York City, the Bronx. It is an area historically plagued by poverty and crime, home to the USA's poorest congressional district. But in recent years, it's transformed into a vibrant, culturally diverse community. On August 12, 2012, this borough was once again thrust into the spotlight, this time due to the baffling murder of 26-year-old Pamela Graddick. This grim incident echoed the city's history of crime, leaving questions about the motive and culprits behind this tragedy. Pamela Graddick was born in 1986 and raised in the Bronx, New York City. She was the daughter of Bernard Graddick and grew up as the youngest of four siblings. The name of her mother is unknown, However, her cousin Andrea Nichols also had an influential part in her upbringing. During her high school years at Walton High School in the Bronx, Pamela excelled not only academically, but also on the basketball court, earning a reputation as a star player. After high school, she continued her passion for basketball. At Sullivan County Community College in Lock Sheldrake, New York, Standing tall at 5 foot 9 inches, Pamela had a strong presence both in her career and personal life. Her sister, Tawana Graddick, played a significant role in her upbringing after their mother's passing, as she was 14 years older than her sister. Pamela, after her teenage years, was known for her career as a daycare worker in the Bronx, a role she took very seriously. Pamela also shared an apartment on Morris Avenue in the Bronx with her roommate Wanda Vegia and her children. Wanda also happened to be her girlfriend and was five years older than Pamela. By 2012, Pamela's life seemed to radiate with promise. Her job brought her joy. Her friendships enriched her days. And a bright future lay ahead. Yet unbeknownst to her, destiny had a different path in store, a path that would lead her story to intersect with a tragic event. It was the evening of August 11, 2012. Pamela Graddick had an enjoyable day shopping with her friend at the Gateway Center Mall near Yankee Stadium. Her plans were simple. She was heading back home to her apartment as she had an important role lined up as a teacher's assistant the next day. Little did anyone know, this would be their last time seeing her. Two days later, on August 13, 2012, Wanda Vagia, Pamela's roommate, became concerned when she couldn't find Pamela and contacted her relatives. She informed them that Pamela was missing and that she herself was out of town at the time and just got back home. Wanda also stated that she discovered Pamela's personal belongings still in the apartment, but no sign of Pamela herself. The situation grew increasingly desperate for Pamela's relatives, leading them to take action by contacting the police and reporting Pamela as missing two days after her disappearance. As uncertainty deepened, a cloud of worry settled over the Graddick family. In the next few days, news of Pamela Graddick's disappearance quickly spread throughout the neighborhood, sparking deep concern among residents. Friends and neighbors demanded a search effort that extended across the nearby woods and roadsides, hoping to discover any trace of her. Then, on September 4, 2012, at 5.35 p.m., almost three weeks after her disappearance, 
Officers from the Yonkers Police Department responded to a 911 call about a suspicious package found in the woods in a remote corner of Yonkers. The residents also reported a foul smell coming from the nearby woods. Upon arrival at the scene, first responders were met with a haunting discovery. A decomposing human body, concealed within a large black garbage bag. The case was immediately handed over to detectives from the department's major case squad and crime scene unit, who began their investigation. The lifeless body was, unfortunately, of Pamela Graddick. Following the discovery, her body was sent for an autopsy, where further examination aimed to shed light on the circumstances surrounding her disappearance and the events that led to this heartbreaking conclusion. The official report from the autopsy revealed a horrifying truth. Pamela had been shot twice in the head and her body was then dumped at a location outside of Yonkers in the woods in an attempt to conceal the crime. In response to this shocking revelation, law enforcement authorities swiftly initiated an intensive investigation, determined to unravel the mystery surrounding Pamela's tragic demise. With numerous unanswered questions and a desire for justice, detectives launched their efforts casting a suspicion on several individuals. Early in the investigation, Wanda Vagia, Pamela's living girlfriend, emerged as a person of interest. When questioned, Vagia reportedly informed the police that she had last seen Pamela leave for a club with a friend on August 11, 2012. She claimed to have gone to visit family members and returned to their apartment on August 13, only to find Pamela had vanished. One notable challenge that investigators faced was understanding how Wanda Vagia, who was smaller in stature, could have moved Pamela's larger body from their apartment to the remote wooded area. Despite two years of dedicated investigation, authorities struggled to gather sufficient evidence to press charges against anyone involved in Pamela's tragic death. As a result, the case was eventually transferred to the Yonkers Police Department Cold Case Unit, where exhaustive efforts continued. Detectives tirelessly analyzed evidence, conducted interviews, and pursued every available lead. However, despite their unwavering commitment, they couldn't find the answers they were looking for. The circumstances surrounding Pamela Granick's untimely end remained veiled in mystery, leaving her grieving family in despair and longing for the closure and justice that continued to elude them. Given the complexity of the case and the lack of immediate local leads, the investigation was moved to the cold case unit of Yonkers Police Department in 2014. Over the following seven years, cold case detectives diligently and persistently focused on the case. They put in ongoing efforts to improve the available information, gather additional evidence, and maintain connections with the victim's family. While suspicions remained, the absence of conclusive evidence made it challenging to move the case forward. Despite their best efforts, the case gradually went cold, leaving the mystery surrounding Pamela Graddock's tragic death unresolved. The initial suspicion surrounding Wanda Vagia persisted despite her claims that she hadn't seen Pamela Graddock since August 11th and returned home to find Pamela's personal items still in their apartment. In 2017, Vagia was re-interviewed, and she adhered to her original statement, asserting that she had been away during the crucial weekend. I wasn't here that weekend. I went away, Vagia said at the time. However, on January 24, 2022, 
Cold case detectives decided to re-examine the evidence using new technology, particularly Pamela's recovered cell phone data. This pivotal re-examination revealed significant information linking Vagia to the crime. The police said that information from the phone helped prove that Vagia's alibi, which she had shared with the TV channel during a 2017 interview, was not accurate. This breakthrough led to a confession from Wanda Vagia during a fresh round of questioning in 2022. Despite this confession, the motive behind the killing remained unclear. Investigators also suspected the involvement of an accomplice in disposing of Pamela's body. It was also revealed that Vagia had assistance in committing the crime from an individual who was later convicted and sentenced. This individual, John Torres, faced charges of criminal facilitation, hindering prosecution, and tampering with physical evidence. Limited information is available about the early lives of Wanda Vagia and John Torres. Public records show that Wanda is a resident of the Bronx, while John Torres resided in Yonkers. Wanda was in a relationship with the victim, Pamela Gratic, at the time of the incident. She lived with Pamela in their apartment in the Bronx. Not much is known about her background, but the fact that she has kids who lived with them in the apartment. John Torres, on the other hand, previously served a five-year prison sentence for robbery and weapons possession before being on post-release supervision since 2019. His specific background and life history are not widely documented, but his alleged involvement in the conspiracy to kill Pamela Gratic has brought him into the public eye. Both Vagia and Torres faced charges related to the murder of Pamela. John Torres played a role as an accomplice in the crime, he provided Wanda with the weapon used in Pamela Gratic's murder. Additionally, Torres assisted in disposing of Gratic's body after the crime occurred. Upon her confession, Wanda faced serious charges after a Westchester County grand jury indicted her for murder in the second degree and tampering with physical evidence. John Torres also found himself indicted for criminal facilitation in the second degree, hindering prosecution in the first degree, and tampering with physical evidence, all felonies. According to the indictment, Vagia fatally shot Pamela in their shared apartment on Morris Avenue in the Bronx. Following the shooting, Vagia, along with Torres, disposed of Gratic's body in a wooded area in Yonkers. Both Vagia and Torres were arrested by Yonkers police in January 2022, following a collaborative investigation with the District Attorney's Office Cold Case Bureau. Then, on April 3, 2023, Wanda pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. She was subsequently sentenced to 20 years to life in state prison. Westchester County District Attorney Mimi Roca stated, Today we have delivered some measure of closure to the families who have lived with these unsolved cases for a combined 36 years. Thanks to the tenacious work by our attorneys, investigators, and our vital police partners, we are securing justice for the victims. Yonkers Police Deputy Chief Joseph Monaco remarked, Wanda was a suspect for, for quite some time in this case. Yonkers Police Commissioner John J. Mueller added, The passage of time only reinforces our commitment to solving these heinous crimes. The Yonkers Police prides itself on focusing on victims and their families, and doing whatever we can to deliver justice for them. It's not just about solving the case, it's about giving closure to the, to the loved ones, the families and friends that have lost this person. Cold case teams often use new technology to re-examine old evidence. During the day of sentencing, Tawana Gratic was visibly upset and expressed her feelings in court. You've taken my sister away from all of us, and I hope you carry the weight of that in your soul. 
I wish for you to never experience freedom again and to spend the rest of your life in jail, living a miserable existence. I hope you never see the light of day. I hope that you are never allowed to walk free outside of your jail cell, outside of that prison. I hope that you understand how much pain you have caused. And I hope it eats you up. Wanda, you are a murderer. I hope you rot in hell. I really do. During the sentencing, the court presented surveillance footage of Graddock's last known movements on August 11, 2012, as she walked home after visiting friends. At the time, it was assumed she was heading home. It also came to light that Wanda killed Pamela while she was sleeping. Tawana, her sister, had this to say. You cannot accidentally find that spot where the body was dumped. And to hear these words, how do you accidentally shoot someone? You had a gun in your hand and it accidentally went off. You accidentally put the safety off. You accidentally triggered, and you accidentally aimed at her while she was sleeping. I hope that you understand how much pain you have caused, and I hope it eats you up. That was calculated. You cannot accidentally find that spot. And to hear these words, how do you accidentally shoot someone? You had the gun in your hand, and it accidentally went off. You accidentally put the safety off. You accidentally pulled the trigger. And you accidentally aimed it at the back of her head while she was sleeping. Tawana Gretik's sister expressed satisfaction with the legal process, but also acknowledged it doesn't bring Pamela back. While the family found closure after a long wait, the fact remains that their beloved Pamela cannot be brought back to them. As we wrap up this story of the Bronx tragedy, what do you think about the recent progress in this long, unresolved case? Do you believe that real justice has finally been delivered after all these years? And how do you think this resolution will impact the community and the affected family? What kind of closure does it offer? Well, a man has pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of the American mathematician Scott Johnson on Sydney's northern beaches. Mr Johnson was found dead at the bottom of a cliff at Manly's North Head in 1988. Scott White had originally admitted to his murder and was sentenced to 12 years in jail before successfully appealing his guilty plea last November. March 18th, 1992. A date etched in history on Hope Street, Geelong West, Australia. It was here just days before her 30th birthday that Annette Stewart's life took a tragic turn. Found lifeless in her residence, the true nature of her demise remained a haunting mystery for 23 long years. It wasn't until 2015 that authorities confirmed the chilling truth. Annette had been strangled. Who could commit such a heinous act? And why did justice elude Annette for over two decades? Join us as we unravel the enigma that shrouds this case, seeking answers that have remained hidden for far too long. Geelong, a port city in the southeastern Australian state of Victoria, boasts a vibrant population with a unique blend of urban and coastal living. Known for its rich history, the city offers a mix of recreational and historic sites, catering to both adventure seekers and history buffs. The locals, known for their warm hospitality, contribute to the city's lively atmosphere. However, like many cities, it's not without its challenges. The crime rate in Geelong has been a concern for residents. This backdrop makes the Annette Stewart cold case of 2023 all the more alarming. 
Annette Stewart, born on April 1, 1963 in Australia to the loving Roy and Margaret Stewart, was the middle child sharing a close bond with her two sisters, Gillian and Jeanette. Their home echoed with love, laughter, and shared joys of three siblings. As life progressed, Annette embraced motherhood with the birth of her daughter, Jacinta, followed by her son, Aaron. Juggling the roles of a single mother and an employee at the Point Henry Ammunition Factory, she ensured a comfortable life for her children. Their close-knit family resided on Hope Street in Geelong West. Friends remembered Annette for her vivacious energy and captivating personality. She was the kind of person whose presence lit up a room. Jacinta recalled her mother's unwavering support and love. Tragically, a shadow loomed over their happy times, just as she was about to celebrate her 30th birthday. On the afternoon of March 17, 1992, Annette Stewart wrapped up her workday at the Point Henry Ammunition Factory. As the clock neared 4.30 p.m., she left her workplace, looking forward to a relaxing evening. Geelong streets bustled with activity as Annette met up with four of her male friends for a shopping spree. The group shared light moments, laughter, and the simple pleasure of each other's company. As the evening progressed, they decided to head back to Annette's place on Hope Street, where they enjoyed tea and conversation. As the night deepened, her friends departed, leaving Annette in the solitude of her home. The tranquility of the night was interrupted when a familiar face, a former flatmate of Annette's, decided to pay her a surprise visit. On March 18th, as he approached her residence, he noticed Annette's car parked outside. Assuming she was home, he made his way in, anticipating a warm greeting from his old friend. But what awaited him was a scene of unimaginable horror. Instead of being greeted by Annette's cheerful voice, he stumbled upon a chilling sight. Annette's lifeless body, devoid of clothing, lay on the floor with an electric cord wrapped around her neck. The weight of the grim discovery was overwhelming. Panic and disbelief gripped him as he tried to process the horrifying scene. Every second felt like an eternity as he grappled with the reality of what he was witnessing. Pushing through his shock, he knew he had to act swiftly. Without hesitation, he reached for the nearest phone and dialed the police, relaying the harrowing details of his discovery. As the sirens wailed in the distance, the quiet neighborhood of Geelong West was about to be thrust into the spotlight, forever marked by the tragic events of that fateful day. The immediate aftermath of Annette Stewart's tragic discovery saw a flurry of activity from the local police. The investigation was launched with urgency, as detectives sought to piece together the final moments of Annette's life. It was established that Annette had left her job at Point Henry around 4.30 p.m., just a day before the grim discovery in her home. The crime scene yielded foreign DNA, the specifics of which remain undisclosed, adding another layer of complexity to the case. As investigators delved deeper, they reached out to Annette's close circle of friends, hoping to find any leads or inconsistencies in the accounts of her last known activities. It was during these conversations that the startling revelation of Annette hosting a dinner at her home the night before her demise, sharing a meal with four friends, emerged. This piece of information sent ripples through the community. The thought that four individuals had been in close proximity to Annette mere hours before her tragic end, and yet nothing seemed amiss, was baffling. 
The autopsy results confirmed the community's worst fears. Annette had been strangled, her life taken away in a brutal act of violence. The case was officially classified as a homicide. The impact of this revelation was profound, especially on her two children, Jacinta and Aaron. At the tender ages of 13 and 10 respectively, they were left grappling with the loss of their mother, a void that could never truly be filled. Despite the investigators' relentless efforts, the case leads began to wane. The initial momentum, driven by the urgency to bring justice to Annette, started to fade. The once promising leads turned into dead ends, and the fervor of the investigation cooled down, with the case turning cold. Years passed, and the memory of Annette Stewart's tragic end remained etched in the minds of the Geelong West community. As the calendar pages turned, marking 15 years since that fateful day, a significant development emerged in 2007. Craig Cameron Rogers, a former co-worker of Annette, was identified as the primary suspect by coroner Ian West. Rogers' accounts to the police raised suspicions, placing him under the investigative spotlight. Annette's sister, Jillian Stewart, expressed her sentiments on this revelation. She felt a mix of relief and hope, stating that the identification of Rogers as a suspect aligned with the family's suspicions. Hearing it from an official source, the coroner, brought a sense of validation to their long-held beliefs. Jillian remarked, It was everything we expected, and it was good to hear it from the coroner. However, naming a suspect didn't equate to a swift resolution. The police, while considering Rogers a person of interest, did not press charges. The investigation continued, with detectives tirelessly pursuing every lead, every hint, and every possible connection. Yet the elusive breakthrough that would tie a suspect conclusively to Annette's murder remained out of reach. In a bid to reignite the investigation and encourage potential informants to come forward, the Victoria Police Department took a significant step in 2015. They announced a reward of $1 million for anyone who could provide information leading to the resolution of Annette's case. Also, her children were made to make an emotional request to the public, asking anyone who knew any information about their mother's death to kindly come forward. This substantial reward underscored the department's commitment to solving the case and bringing closure to Annette's family. The announcement of the reward served as a stark reminder that even after all these years, the quest for justice for Annette Stewart was far from over. The community and the police held on to the hope that someone, somewhere, held the key to unlocking the mystery of that tragic day in 1992. The quest for justice in the Annette Stewart case took a significant turn five years later, in January of 2020. Detectives from both Victoria and West Australia made a breakthrough, linking two murder cases that, on the surface, seemed unrelated. This connection led to the arrest of 52-year-old Darren John Chalmers in Perth's Wembley district. Chalmers wasn't just a name pulled out of obscurity. He was already a prime suspect in another case, the disappearance and subsequent murder of a 59-year-old woman from Medina, known as Diane Barrett. The linking of these two cases was a testament to the meticulous work of the detectives, who even after years, never let go of any thread, no matter how thin. Darren John Chalmers, born in 1967 in Victoria, 
wasn't just a name in the headlines. He was a man with a tumultuous past. From his teenage years, Chalmers was a ward of the state, a clear indication that his early life was far from idyllic. The scars of abuse, both from men and women, marred his formative years, planting seeds of rage that would grow unchecked. This anger, particularly directed towards women, became a defining trait. As he grew older, Chalmers sought solace in drugs, but instead of relief, they only amplified his violent tendencies. Meth, in particular, would send him into uncontrollable rages, further distancing him from any semblance of a normal life. While many face hardships and traumas, Chalmers allowed his to shape him into a figure of menace. His history of violence wasn't just a result of his drug-induced states. It was a manifestation of the pain and anger that had been brewing within him for years. Darren John Chalmers stood before the judge for his first trial on January 6, 2020. He was charged with the murder of Diane Barrett, a case that had sent shockwaves through the community. With a heavy heart, he pleaded guilty, recounting the chilling events of that fateful night. After sharing a meal at Diane's place, she had accompanied him to his home. There, in a sudden and unprovoked act, Chalmers overpowered her, injecting her with methamphetamine, before strangling her with his bare hands and a metal bar. The coldness of his actions was further highlighted when he dumped Diane's body in a brushland. Later, he watched the news about the case with a friend. Chalmers nonchalantly remarked, Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? His lack of remorse was evident. But Diane's case wasn't the only shadow hanging over Chalmers. Detectives began to connect the dots between him and the tragic death of Annette Stewart. While no immediate charges were pressed, the police were confident they had found Annette's killer. Their statement to the media was clear. They weren't looking for anyone else. The arrest of Chalmers brought a mix of emotions. There was hope that perhaps, after all these years, the mystery surrounding Annette's tragic end might finally be unraveled. The community, which had been haunted by the unresolved case for nearly three decades, looked on with bated breath, hoping that this new lead would shed light on the dark shadows of the past. By March 2023, Chalmers was transported from Perth to Victoria, where he was charged with Annette Stewart's murder. For Diane's case, he received a life sentence with the possibility of parole in 2040. The weight of his actions began to sink in as he awaited his trial for Annette's murder. Scheduled to appear at the Melbourne Magistrates Court on March 20, 2023, Chalmers was seen wearing glasses and prison attire via video link. His next court date was set for June 13, 2023. The motive behind these heinous acts remained a mystery. But one thing was clear. Two vibrant lives were cruelly snuffed out, leaving families and communities grappling with the loss. The courtroom was tense as Darren John Chalmers stood before the Victorian Supreme Court in June of 2023. This was a moment that many had been waiting for, especially the family of Annette Stewart. When asked how he would like to plead to the 1992 murder of Annette, Chalmers softly uttered a single word that sent ripples through the room. Guilty. By admitting his guilt, Chalmers confirmed that he had taken Annette's life on March 16, 1992, two days before her body was discovered. The judge ordered that he be remanded into custody, setting a pre-sentence hearing for November of 2023. Annette Stewart's family members had moved out of state over the years. They would be making the journey back to Victoria specifically for the hearing. 
a testament to how much they needed closure and justice for Annette. Do you think justice was adequately served? And if not, what kind of punishment do you think Chalmers deserved? We're eager to hear your perspective. If there's another case you'd like us to delve into, please drop your recommendations in the comments section below. On October 26, 1997, a startling discovery was made in the Ryan Slough, a river near Eureka, California. A duck hunter stumbled upon a dismembered torso, and despite efforts, the female victim couldn't be identified. Just a few months later, in January 1998, more remains surfaced on Calm Beach. The mystery deepened as the community grappled with these unsettling findings. Who was this woman? And how did her remains end up in these two separate locations? Today's case takes us to Eureka, located in California, a coastal city with a rich history. With a population of over 27,000, it's a place where the past meets the present. Eureka is renowned for its historic architecture, which plays a significant role in the daily lives of its residents. Living here offers a blend of recreational spots like parks and beaches, and heritage sites such as Carson Mansion, Eureka Inn, and Blue Ox Millworks, the telltales of yesteryears. The community is tight-knit with friendly folks who value their shared history. However, like many cities, Eureka faces challenges. Its crime rate, though not the highest, is notable. In 1998, the discovery of the remains of an unidentified woman became a somber reminder of this reality. In the heart of Eureka, a town known for its historic charm and coastal beauty, a chilling event on October 26, 1997 would soon cast a shadow over its peaceful streets. It was a day like any other for a local duck hunter, a man familiar with every nook and cranny of the Ryan Slough. He had spent countless mornings there, seeking the perfect spot for his hunt. But that day, the tranquility of his routine was shattered. As he ventured out, gear in hand, he was met with a sight that would haunt the town for years to come. A dismembered torso lay on the muddy banks of the slough. The grim discovery sent shockwaves throughout Eureka. The once serene spot, where families picnicked and children played, was now tainted with a dark mystery. Word spread rapidly. Local newspapers, television channels, and radio stations were flooded with the news. Theories and speculations ran rampant. The town, which had always prided itself on its sense of community and safety, was now gripped with fear. Evening strolls by the slough became a thing of the past, replaced by hushed conversations and wary glances. The media dubbed the unidentified woman as the Torso Girl, a name that would stick for years. Her story became the talk of the town, a mystery that loomed large in the minds of Eureka's residents. The police acted swiftly. The vicinity of the slough was sealed off, and an extensive search operation was launched. Dive teams delved into the depths of the waters. Canine units scoured the nearby woods, and helicopters circled above, all in a desperate bid to uncover any clues. Yet, with its murky waters and dense surroundings, the Ryan Slough seemed to guard its secrets well. Days turned into nights, but no substantial leads emerged. The identity of the Torso Girl 
and the circumstances leading to her tragic end remained elusive. In this uncertainty, the people of Eureka showcased their indomitable spirit. The town came together like never before. Candlelight vigils illuminated the nights, and the local church opened its doors to those seeking comfort and answers. The community, having weathered many storms in the past, stood united in its grief and resolve. Neighbors counseled one another. Friends shared memories and families held their loved ones closer. The collective determination to uncover the truth and bring justice to the Torso Girl was palpable. The Eureka Police Department, spurred by the urgency of the situation, launched an intensive investigation into the chilling discovery. Every available resource was mobilized, and the town was abuzz with activity. Yet as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the leads grew sparse. The trail, once filled with promise, began to wane. However, in January of the subsequent year after the torso was discovered, similar remains were located at Calm Beach, approximately 20 miles to the north of the initial discovery site. At the time, despite suspicions, there was no way to confirm whether they were from the same person. Then, in a twist that no one saw coming, on November 3rd, 1998, a man named Wayne Adam Ford walked into the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. In his possession was a plastic bag, and shockingly, a female body part was inside it. Ford, an ex-Marine turned long-haul trucker, made a chilling confession. He admitted to ending the lives of several women across the North State, including the unidentified female from the slough. Investigators sensing a breakthrough delved deep into Ford's background. They interviewed him multiple times, each session revealing more about his dark deeds. During the interview session, he claimed not knowing the identity of the woman as he had abducted her without knowing who she was. His home became a focal point of the investigation. A thorough search yielded additional remains, confirming the link to the woman found in the slough. Wayne Adam Ford, the name that would become synonymous with a series of heinous crimes, had a complex past. Born in Petaluma, California on December 3, 1961, his early life was marked by his parents' divorce when he was just 10. Ford's journey took a turn when he decided to drop out of high school and join the U.S. Marine Corps. He served honorably for six years before being discharged in 1985. A significant event in Ford's life occurred in November of 1980. A drunk driver hit him, resulting in a severe head injury that left him in a coma for nine days. Those close to him noted a stark change in his personality after this incident. By 1983, Ford faced increasing challenges at work, coupled with a deteriorating mental state that led to multiple hospitalizations. He was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Ford's criminal history began to manifest in the mid-1980s. In 1986, he faced allegations of assaulting and robbing a woman in Garden Grove, California. A few years later, in 1990, he was arrested for animal cruelty in San Clemente, California, serving a brief jail sentence. Between 1997 and 1998, Ford's crimes escalated. He resided in a trailer park in Arcata, California during this period. His first known victim was the unidentified woman from October 1997. This was followed by the tragic deaths of Tina Reese Gibbs in May of 1998, near Las Vegas. 
Lynette Dion White in September of 1998 in Ontario, California, and Patricia Ann Thames of Hesperia, California. Each of these women met a grim fate, with their bodies discovered in various locations across the state. Despite these revelations, a significant challenge remained. The identity of the woman, the torso girl as she had come to be known, was still a mystery as Ford himself had abducted her without ever learning who she was. Efforts to identify her intensified, with law enforcement exploring every possible avenue. Yet the answers remained elusive, and the case turned cold. The culmination of Ford's criminal activities led to his arrest and subsequent trial. In June of 2006, he was convicted for the lives he took and was sentenced to execution in August of the same year. Today, Wayne Adam Ford remains incarcerated at the San Quentin State Prison in California, a testament to the justice system's efforts to ensure he pays for his actions. Over the years, the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office remained steadfast in its commitment to identifying Ford's unidentified female victim. Their dedication led them to consistently sift through missing person reports from the entire West Coast, hoping to find a lead. A significant breakthrough came when DNA tests confirmed that the remains found on Calm Beach belonged to the same unidentified woman. This DNA was then catalogued in both the California Missing Persons DNA database and the National Unidentified Persons DNA Index. Despite their efforts, the DNA profile was routinely checked against other profiles in the combined DNA index systems, but no matches were found. The case was then added to the National Missing and Unidentified Person System hoping for a broader reach and potential leads. In 2021, Sheriff William Hunsell of the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office took a significant step forward by establishing a cold case unit. He assigned two dedicated investigators to revisit unsolved cases and search for new leads. Their persistence paid off in December of 2022 when a collaboration was formed with the California Department of Justice and Othram Incorporated. The goal was to see if advanced forensic DNA testing could potentially identify the unknown female, or at least a close relative. Othram Inc. played a pivotal role by extracting DNA from the woman's remains and using forensic-grade genome sequencing to construct a comprehensive DNA profile. This profile, combined with forensic genealogy, led to a potential DNA match with a close relative of the victim. Upon contacting this relative in 2022, investigators learned about a family member named Carrie who had been missing since the mid-1990s. The next step was to reach out to Carrie's sister, Kathy. In 2023, Kathy confirmed that the last time anyone in the family had contact with Carrie was in 1997. To solidify the findings, Kathy provided a DNA sample. When this sample was compared to the DNA from the unidentified remains, the results were conclusive. The DNA profiles matched and the once unidentified remains were officially recognized as those of Carrie Ann Cummings. Carrie Ann Cummings, born 1972, was a vibrant soul who at the age of 25 had her life tragically cut short. Born into a loving family, Carrie's early years were filled with laughter, creativity, and the promise of a bright future. Carrie was not just any individual. She was an artist with a flair for making those around her laugh. Her sister Kathy often reminisced about when Carrie's humor lit up a room. 
She described Carrie as beautiful, funny, and smart. But beneath the surface, Carrie grappled with untreated mental illness. In her last contact with her family in 1997, she revealed that she was couch surfing in the Eugene, Oregon area. Despite the challenges she faced, Carrie's spirit remained unbroken. She was fiercely independent, even turning down multiple offers from her family to return home. However, the years that followed were marked by uncertainty and concern. After Carrie went missing, her distraught parents tried everything they could to find her. They attempted to report her missing in Arizona and Oregon, and hired a private investigator. However, due to the laws at the time, their efforts were in vain. Carrie was never officially listed as a missing person, or entered into any national missing persons database. The heartbreak was palpable, with Kathy recalling how they were told that Carrie had chosen the lifestyle and that there was little law enforcement could do. As the years passed and the internet became more accessible, Kathy clung to hope. She often scoured the Name Us website, searching for any mention of Carrie especially references to her unique tattoo. She would painstakingly go through pictures of Jane Doe's, hoping against hope to find a familiar face. Through it all, one thing remained clear. Carrie was dearly loved. The Humboldt County Coroner's Division has taken steps to work closely with Carrie Ann Cummings' family. Their goal is to release Carrie's remains so she can be laid to rest alongside family members who have passed before her. Sheriff William Hansel thanked the teams that made the identification possible. He said, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to California Department of Justice DNA Lab and Othram for their exceptional work and assistance in resolving this case. Sheriff Hansel emphasized that while nothing can truly erase the pain of loss, the identification of Carrie offers a semblance of closure to her family and the broader community. The dedication of the investigators was also highlighted. These professionals remained unwavering in their commitment to Carrie, ensuring her case was never forgotten. They continue to work diligently aiming to resolve other unsolved cases that still linger in the shadows. While the conviction remains that Wayne Adam Ford played a pivotal role in this tragic event, the investigation remains open. The community's assistance is invaluable in such cases. Anyone holding information that could shed more light on this case is encouraged to step forward. Investigator Mark Fridley is the point of contact, and he can be reached at 707-441-3024. So what are your thoughts on this case? And considering the challenges faced in the Carrie Ann Cummings case, how can law enforcement improve the reporting and tracking of missing persons? Five, a police raid in Bergen County, New Jersey, leads to the arrest of a suspected killer. And the suspect can be seen wearing a Hasidic-style hat and long black robe as he approaches the victim's car and opens fire. In the early hours of September 6, 2021, Jermaine Dixon, age 46, faced a tragic fate on South Conduit Avenue, South Ozone Park. As he approached his car, an assailant dressed in what seemed like religious attire targeted him, intending to steal the $10,000 Dixon had. However, the attacker fled without the money after the incident. Who was behind this calculated ambush? And what past did Dixon have with this assailant leading to his death? Queens, New York is a bustling borough with a diverse population of over 2 million people as of the 2020 census. Known for its unique blend of cultures, 
It offers a vibrant lifestyle. Living in Queens, you'll find a mix of recreational and historic places, reflecting its rich history and dynamic present. The people here are as diverse as the borough itself, contributing to its lively and inclusive atmosphere. However, despite its many positives, Queens is not without its issues. The crime rate, well, not the highest, is notable. The backdrop of daily life in Queens brings us to the cold case of Jermaine Dixon in 2021, a stark reminder of the crime that persists in the area. Jermaine Dixon, born on October 1, 1974, hailed from the tough streets of Brooklyn, New York. Growing up amidst hardship and violence, he was inevitably drawn to the allures of the streets. As a teenager, he joined the infamous Patio Crew, a group known for its notorious reputation in Flatbush. Rising through the ranks, Dixon became known as a fierce enforcer, his name synonymous with violence. In 1992, a dark chapter unfolded. Germain and his brother Emil were convicted for the murder of Alfonso Gooden. This crime marked the beginning of Dixon's 19-year incarceration, a period that saw him grappling with his past actions and the path he had chosen. Despite his violent history, prison became a place of transformation for Jermaine Dixon. He evolved into a model prisoner, earning respect from inmates and guards alike. His pursuit of a business bachelor's degree reflected his commitment to change. In a heartfelt plea for a compassionate release, Dixon expressed accountability for his actions and a fervent desire to prove his worth. Addressing Judge Raymond Derry, he wrote, It is clear that I am not the young man that your honor sentenced 20 years ago. I am now asking your honor to again take a chance with me and let me re-enter society to prove myself, my mother, children, family, and also the court that I can and will do the right thing upon release. His words echoed in commitment to transformation and a second chance at life. Released on parole in 2011, Dixon moved to Ozone Park, Queens, carrying hopes of rebuilding his life and leaving his criminal past behind. His commitment to change was palpable, yet the shadows of his criminal history loomed large making his path to reformation a challenging endeavor. Despite his earnest efforts, the scrutiny of authorities and the struggle to detach from his past life were constant companions. On the ill-fated morning of September 6, 2021, in South Ozone Park, a meticulously planned act of violence unfolded. Jeremy Dixon, a 46-year-old man earnestly working on rebuilding his life, was caught off guard. At 8 a.m., a shooter, later identified from Teaneck, New Jersey, was captured on surveillance video. Dressed in what seemed like traditional Hasidic attire, the assailant stood beside a white Nissan sedan, seemingly engaged in vehicle repair. As Dixon approached his Ford Edge SUV, the scene took a horrifying turn. The assailant swiftly grabbed a hidden firearm from within the car's engine, approached Dixon from behind, and shot him in the head at point-blank range. Despite a hurried search of Dixon's body, the shooter left empty-handed closing the Nissan's hood and departing the scene in another vehicle. 
Notably, a second person had been keeping watch during this brutal attack. Further highlighting the planned nature of this crime. The assailant, clad in white gloves and a white face mask, had been stalking Dixon for several hours, lying in wait to ambush him as he approached his car. The alleged attempt to steal $10,000 from Dixon's pocket was unsuccessful, leaving the neighborhood in shock and raising serious concerns about safety and security in the area. Detectives on the case unearthed that Dixon had been staying at a nearby Comfort Inn. Sources close to the investigation disclosed Dixon's constant vigilance as he moved around the neighborhood, hinting at his awareness of being a target. This cautious behavior, coupled with the brutal attack, led investigators to suspect that narcotics trade as the motive behind this senseless killing. In the aftermath of the shooting, the quest for justice swiftly commenced. Detectives diligently sifted through the vast amount of surveillance footage from the area. The cameras recorded a man dressed in traditional Hasidic clothing during the disturbing incident. This disguise, however, could not conceal the perpetrator's identity for long. Before donning the deceptive attire, the shooter was captured on camera, his features laid bare. The investigation led to the identification of the man as Ron Reeder, a man with a history marked by three sealed arrests in the city. The pieces of the puzzle began to align, painting a clearer picture of the events that transpired on that fateful day. Eyewitness accounts, surveillance footage, and ballistic evidence converged solidifying Reader's identification and his role in the cold-blooded attack. The evidence pointed unequivocally to Reader as the one who pulled the trigger, ending Jermaine Dixon's life in a brutal instant. Yet the investigation's chapters were not fully closed. A second suspect, the watchful accomplice in the calculated ambush, remained elusive. The search continued as the authorities sought to bring in all involved to account for the merciless act. The community, still reeling from the shock and the loss, clung to the hope of justice. The hard work of the investigators brought some hope in a tough time. They helped find answers and comfort for the family and friends who were grieving. While they kept looking for the second suspect in South Ozone Park, the sad event was a reminder of a life lost too soon and the ongoing search for justice. Born in the state of New Jersey in 1970, Reeder spent his formative years in Teaneck, a town where he was drawn into a world of crime and violence at a young age. His association with a notorious gang marked the beginning of a life steeped in criminal activities. Known for their violent tactics in the local drug trade, the gang saw Reeder rise through the ranks, his name synonymous with ruthlessness. His criminal journey was marked with incarceration, a reflection of his life choices. In 1986, a robbery and weapon possessions charge led to a four to six year sentence of which he served three years. His criminal endeavors did not end there. A manslaughter charge added a significant 21 year sentence to his record, leading to his parole in 2012. Despite these run-ins with the law, Reader managed to maintain a low profile post his release. The semblance of normalcy, however, was shattered in 2021. 
identified as the shooter in the high-profile killing of Jermaine Dixon, his past resurfaced, casting a shadow on his present. His attempt to disguise himself in Hasidic-style clothing during the crime did little to evade the law's reach. Currently, Reader faces murder and weapon charges. His apprehension a result of the combined efforts of the Bergen County Regional SWAT team and the NYPD. The raid of his Garden State apartment in late February marked the culmination of the search for the man behind the cold-blooded killing, bringing a sense of closure to the community and reiterating the relentless pursuit of justice. On the 23rd of February 2023, the law finally caught up with Ron Reeder. At the age of 52, he was apprehended in New Jersey. The swift actions of law enforcement ensured his extradition to New York, facing the weight of his actions with charges of murder and weapons possession laid before him. The arrest of Reeder, well a step towards justice, leaves behind a trail of questions, reflections, and a somber acknowledgement of a life abruptly halted. Amidst the relief of the arrest, the whispers of Dixon's name continued to reverberate, a call to remember the man beyond the case, and a nudge to continually seek justice and peace for communities grappling with the shadows of violence. The clarity regarding a second culprit involved in the crime was still shrouded in uncertainty. The police were navigating through the intricate paths of investigation, leaving no stone unturned. Jermaine Dixon, hailing from Brooklyn, New York, faced a tragic end not long after reclaiming his freedom from the prison's confines where he served time for drug charges. His life, marked with efforts to rebuild and recover, was cut short, leaving behind echoes of questions and the quest for complete justice. The relentless efforts of the Bergen County Regional SWAT team, alongside the NYPD, played a crucial role in unwinding the tangled threads of the case. Their dedication and commitment to unveiling the truth brought a measure of solace to the Dixon family. In the midst of all the chaos and strong feelings, justice came through, helping the family and friends find some peace and start to heal. The fight for justice goes on, showing the dedication on making sure everyone is safe and free from harm and crime. So what are your thoughts on the Jermaine Dixon case? Could something have been done differently to prevent this tragedy? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. On May 11, 2007, a shocking discovery was made in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Denise Lee First, a 64-year-old man, was found lifeless in his apartment, number 5 at 2249 C Street Southwest, by one of his neighbors, Robert Gross. Robert quickly phoned 911 after the discovery, and they arrived at the scene in no time. The evidence showed he'd been seriously attacked, suffering both stab wounds and blunt force injuries. What led to this tragic event? And who could have committed such a heinous act? Our case today begins in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, a vibrant city known for its balance between recreational and historic sites, offering residents a rich lifestyle. Living here, you'll find a community that values both leisure and heritage, with various parks and museums sprinkled throughout. The people in Cedar Rapids are known for their warmth and hospitality, making newcomers feel right at home. 
with a population of 137,896 and still growing. The city boasts a tapestry of cultures and backgrounds. However, like any city, Cedar Rapids has its challenges. It experiences crime, though not at alarming rates. In 2023, the city witnessed the resolution of a cold case involving Dennis Lee, bringing a measure of closure to the community. Dennis Lee first entered the world on September 11, 1942. Born to Millard and Elvra first, not many details about Dennis's early life are available to the public. In the summer of 1962, on June 17th, Dennis decided to spend the rest of his life with Christine Griffin, and the two got married. The union was blessed with two children, their son Brad, born in 1963, and a daughter Laura, who came along two years later in 1965. In the 1970s, Dennis and Christine set up their home in Olin, located in Jones County, Iowa. During this period, Dennis was employed as a purchasing agent at a steel company situated in Monticello. However, the marriage between Dennis and Christine didn't stand the test of time, ending in divorce in 1981. Following the separation, Dennis moved to Cedar Rapids, where he would spend the rest of his life. Life threw its share of challenges at Dennis, from May 1990 onwards, he had several run-ins with the law, facing arrests for theft from local businesses and driving under the influence. He was also accused of making threats against a man from whom he rented a room. Tragedy struck in 1993 when he lost his son Brad in a car accident. In December of 1996, court documents from Lynn County District Court revealed that Dennis, then 54, was charged with second offense drunk driving, following an arrest on March 1st for his first arrest for drunk driving. However, he pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of first offense drunk driving. The court ordered him to pay a $500 fine, handed him a 60-day suspended sentence, and placed him on probation. A few years later, living in his efficiency apartment, apartment number 5 at 2249 C Street Southwest in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Dennis, a prostate cancer patient, led a life of solitude, with few visitors and Social Security as his financial support. Dennis was known in the community as a peaceful individual. He was the kind of man who acknowledged everyone with a greeting took delight in feeding birds and squirrels, and generally kept to himself. Over the years, Dennis lost contact with his daughter Laura, his ex-wife Christine, and other family members. However, a few years before his tragic death, he reached out to both again, rekindling the familial bonds without asking for anything in return. In the months leading up to his untimely death, the police were called to his apartment five times for various reasons, including medical issues and disturbances. On the morning of May 11, 2007, the quiet life of 64-year-old Dennis Lee first came to a tragic halt. The day unfolded with an unexpected turn when a concerned friend of Dennis called Tammy Mims, the assistant manager at Hawthorne Hills Apartments. The friend's request was simple. Could someone check on Dennis? Acting promptly, Tammy reached out to Robert Gross, a maintenance worker at the apartment complex. With eight years of service under his belt, Robert approached Dennis's apartment around 7.30 a.m., knocked several times, and upon receiving no response, decided to enter. The sight that greeted Robert was somber. Dennis was found lying on his bed, face up, with his feet touching the floor. A quick glance was enough for Robert to realize that something was amiss. Dennis was motionless, with a dried streak of blood marking its path from his mouth to his cheek, 
settling on the bed. Upon discovering the body, Robert Gross immediately dialed 911, setting into motion the wheels of justice. Following the discovery of Dennis Lee's first body, the police swung into action, initiating an investigation into the murder that had occurred within the quiet confines of Cedar Rapids. The evidence collected from the crime scene was meticulously packed and sent to the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation State Crime Lab in Ankeny, where experts would analyze every detail, hoping to piece together the events that led to the tragic ends of Dennis Lee First. The neighborhood was abuzz with activity, as law enforcement officers knocked on doors, questioning residents in an attempt to gather any piece of information that could shed light on the circumstances surrounding Dennis's death. According to Curtis Paget, a neighbor who occasionally helped Dennis roll cigarettes, he had seen Dennis alive just two days prior. Curtis had planned to visit Dennis that Friday morning, only to witness his body being taken away. Another neighbor, Mark Stender, had checked on Dennis the previous day at noon and reported that he seemed fine the news of Dennis's death, therefore, came as a shock to Mark, who couldn't reconcile the lively image of his neighbor with the reality that unfolded on that fateful Friday. The autopsy report provided a grim reading, detailed the extent of the violence that Dennis had suffered in his final moments. The cause of death was determined to be multiple blunt force injuries. One of the most significant wounds was a large gaping cut on the right side of his neck, measuring over three inches wide. The edges of this wound were ragged, indicating a violent application of force. But the cruelty didn't stop there. Dennis's face bore the evidence of a severe beating, with large contusions marking his face, forehead, and left ear. Cuts were visible above his upper lip, and a broken nose spoke of the ferocity with which he was attacked. Further examination revealed brain hemorrhaging among other injuries, painting a picture of a man who had been mercilessly beaten. The police treated Dennis's death as a homicide, given the clear signs of foul play. However, despite their best efforts, the initial stages of the investigation didn't yield any arrests. The neighborhood residents who were questioned provided little information that could lead to a potential suspect. With each passing day, the trail grew colder, and the prospects of solving Dennis's murder seemed increasingly bleak. As the case files began to gather dust, the murder of Dennis Lee first was at risk of becoming another cold case. A tragic tale with no resolution, no closure for the family, and no justice for Dennis. In accordance with Dennis's wishes, no funeral services were held. Arrangements were handled by Fry Funeral Home in Tipton. In the weeks following Dennis Lee's first tragic demise, the Cedar Rapids police were relentless in their pursuit of justice. Late in May 2007, the air in the neighborhood was tense as officers executed five meticulously planned search warrants related to the case. The investigation spotlight not only illuminated Dennis's own living space, but also extended its reach to other apartments casting shadows of suspicion and intrigue. One individual finding himself under the spotlight was 24-year-old Dan Shelton, residing in apartment number seven, situated just across the hall from where Dennis had lived and breathed his last. The proximity naturally rendered Dan's living space of interest to the investigators. Yet after a thorough search of Dan's apartment, the officers exited his premises empty-handed. Nothing within those walls 
seem to connect the tragedy tapestry of the events that unfolded in Dennis's apartment. The search, while extensive, did not yield any items or evidence deemed relevant to the case from Dan's home. However, Dan wasn't the only resident to experience the investigation's intensity firsthand. The officers also directed their attention to the residence of Curtis Paget, who resided in the same neighborhood as Dennis. Curtis had previously mentioned his occasional assistance to Dennis in rolling cigarettes. The police, leaving no stone unturned, conducted two thorough searches of Paget's apartment. Curtis himself was subject to scrutiny, with officers taking essential forensic samples, including his fingerprints and DNA. The search also yielded a pair of boots belonging to Paget, among other items, which were carefully bagged and tagged as potential evidence. The Gazette, a local publication, brought this development to public attention in an article published on May 24, 2007. Through this piece, the community learned of the police's meticulous efforts, with Curtis Paget sharing his experience of the investigation process. However, moving on to getting more information about Curtis, when the police looked further into his background, they found some disturbing information. Curtis Randall Paget, born in 1981, remains an enigmatic figure, with much of his early life, education, and family details remaining concealed from public knowledge. Known to have lived at Geneva Tower, he had not walked through life unnoticed, having entangled himself with the law on various occasions. His name surfaced in connection to a chilling cold case from Cedar Rapids dating back to 2001. This particular case revolved around the disappearance of a 15-year-old girl named Erin Pospisil. Erin, young and full of life, vanished without a trace on June 3, 2001, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and aching hearts. Paget, who was acquainted with Erin through her older brother, was one of the last individuals to see her before her disappearance. According to his account, he was supposed to give Aaron a ride to a friend's house. However, upon arrival at their destination, with no one answering the door, Aaron allegedly opted for a ride from unknown individuals in a black Chevrolet Cavalier, as per Paget's account. This narrative, solely provided by Paget, could not be corroborated by any other witnesses. The mysterious black Cavalier, the unknown individuals, and the events leading to Aaron's disappearance remained locked away, with Paget's story standing as the sole testament to that fateful night. The police, while sifting through the sands of this perplexing case, could not find any evidence to either substantiate or refute Paget's claims. Aaron was never seen again after that night, and the shadows of that unsolved case continued to loom over Paget's life for over 22 years and still counting. Despite suspicions against Paget, the police could find no evidence against him, and eventually, that case turned cold. On the first day of March in 2023, a significant arrest occurred in the Dennis Lee first cold case. Curtis Randall Paget, now 42 years old, found himself ensnared by the hands of justice. He was arrested and charged with the heinous crime of taking Dennis First's life. Lynn County Attorney Nick Maybanks spoke about the arrest, highlighting it as a shining example of the Cedar Rapids Police Department's unwavering dedication to serving both victims and the community at large. The arrest of Paget came after meticulous review and investigation by the department's cold case unit who engaged with Maybanks for a comprehensive review of the case. Following months of rigorous follow-up investigations and a final consultation, a charge of first-degree murder was officially filed against Curtis Paget. During the course of the investigation, a crucial piece of evidence was uncovered in First's apartment, a partial boot print 
imprinted in blood. The print was later matched to boots that were retrieved from Padgett's residence. Additionally, an oven mitt stained with blood was discovered. The mitt bore the DNA of both First and Padgett, with Padgett's DNA found on the inside. Furthermore, a fingerprint belonging to Padgett was identified on a knife sharpener located in First's apartment, found in a drawer that seemed to have blood in it. In a chilling turn of events, it was reported that in 2016, Paget allegedly approached an individual who had no connection to this case near a storage garage, casually mentioning that he had committed a murder nine years prior. This individual later relayed that Paget had identified the victim as someone for whom he used to roll cigarettes. It's important to note that Paget had previously told investigators that he used to roll cigarettes for first. Regarding the case of Aaron Pospisil, in which Paget is also implicated, there have been no significant updates. The last reliable sighting of Aaron was in the spring of 2002, at the convenience store in Cedar Rapids, where she was seen in the backseat of a car with Illinois license plates. Despite efforts, the police were unable to verify this sighting or locate the car in question. Aaron is described as a Caucasian female with dark brown hair and eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she had a small scar above her eye and sported red highlights in her hair. Anyone with information is urged to reach out to the Cedar Rapids Police Department at 319-286-5350. Curtis Paget faced his initial appearance in Lynn County District Court on Thursday morning, March 2, 2023, where he was formally charged with first-degree murder. During this appearance, Paget was seen via video link from the Lynn County Jail, with noticeable protective gear or possibly a blanket wrapped around him, perhaps indicative of the gravity and tension enveloping the proceedings. The presiding judge, 6th Judicial Associate District Judge Casey Jones, set Paget's bail at a substantial amount of $1 million, payable in cash only. After 16 long years, the family of Dennis Lee First finally experienced closure in his case. Christine Burmeister, Dennis's former wife, spoke to the Gazette, reflecting on the challenges he faced in life. He had a rough life, she said, expressing disbelief that someone could bring themselves to kill a man who could hardly defend himself due to his limited mobility. In a heartfelt obituary published on May 14, 2007 in the Cedar Rapids Gazette, first daughter shared her intention to lay her father's ashes to rest in a location that held special significance to him. Despite the distance and hurdles that life placed between them over the years, she emphasized the unbreakable bond of love shared between a father and daughter. Although there were many obstacles over the years keeping us apart, a father's love for his daughter and a daughter's love for her father never falters, she wrote, expressing her wish for her father to now rest in peace. Despite the challenges and estrangements, Dennis was survived by his daughter Laura, her husband Devin Schroeder, and their children Mackenzie and Mitchell. He was also survived by his grandchildren Jacob, Ross, and Jessica First, two great-granddaughters, and his ex-wife Christine, who had since remarried a man named Ken Burmeister. For those who may possess any additional information related to the murder of Dennis First, the Cedar Rapids Police Department is open to receiving your call. 319-286-5400. Your contribution could be invaluable in shedding more light on this case that has brought so much sorrow to the lives of First's loved ones. So what are your thoughts on the resolution of the Dennis Lee First case? Do you believe justice was served? Share your views in the comments. We're eager to hear from you. 
In the last hour, the man convicted of murdering two Northwest Florida women was executed. Michael Zack III, arrested in June 1996 for the killing of 31-year-old Rayvon Kennedy and then confessing to killing 40-year-old Lori Russillo. 96, 31-year-old Ravone Kennedy Smith experienced a terrifying assault in her home in Escambia County near the Gulf Coast. It is said that after meeting Michael Dwayne Zack III at a local bar and befriending him, they proceeded to her home. There, Zack attacked her with a bottle, subjected her to abuse, and later stabbed her four times in the chest using an oyster knife. Why would Mark carry out such an attack on her? And what could have driven him to engage in such violent behavior? Escambia County in Florida's Panhandle merges history with recreational allure, offering a distinctive lifestyle to its roughly 329,192 residents as of 2023. Known for 42 properties on the National Register, like Barrancas National Cemetery and Fort Pickens, its historical essence is palpable. Living here means enjoying Pensacola's relaxed beach town aura, complemented by a lively metropolitan feel amid a friendly community and temperate climate. However, a concerning crime rate overshadows this charm. With violent crime at 4.102 per 1,000 residents, and an overall rate of 7,090 per 100,000 residents, it's deemed one of the more perilous regions in the U.S., epitomized by the chilling 1996 cold case of Ravon Smith. Born in 1965, Ravon Kennedy Smith resided in the tranquil vicinity of Escambia County near the picturesque Gulf Coast. While much of her early life, including the names of her parents, or her personal milestones remained veiled in mystery, it was known that by the age of 31, Ravone had found her calling as a bartender. She was a familiar and friendly face in Pensacola Beach, Florida, where she earned her livelihood. The lounge where she worked wasn't far from where she lived, making it a convenient spot for her and for the locals who cherished her company. Ravone's daily routine involved serving drinks, sharing laughter, and creating a warm atmosphere for everyone who stepped into the lounge. Her presence was a comforting constant for many. Yet amidst the usual hustle and bustle, none could foresee the ominous turn of events that lurked around the corner. The sudden and brutal end of Ravone's life left a void in the hearts of those who knew her. As her death case transitioned into a cold case over the years, the haunting unsolved mystery became a part of the lore of Escambia County, standing as a somber testament to a life that ended way too soon. Michael Dwayne Zack III, born on December 14, 1968, was a figure shrouded in mystery for the most part. He was the only son of Mary Helen Midkiff and also had a sister. Information about his father or place of birth isn't revealed to the public. Before the tragic incident involving Ravone Smith, Michael had made Tallahassee, Florida his home. With time, he became a familiar face at a local bar where he struck up a friendship with the bartender Edith Pope. As their acquaintance grew over casual conversation, Zack unveiled a dark and horrifying tale from his past. He recounted witnessing his sister committing the unthinkable act of murdering their mother with an axe. This eerie revelation left a lasting impression on Edith Pope, who moved by sympathy offered Zack odd jobs around the bar to help him out. The ambience of the bar, once filled with the laughter and small talk of its regulars, became the backdrop of a developing narrative that no one could have foreseen. As the days turned into nights with everyone having a good time at the bar, 
nobody realized the sinister thoughts brewing in Zack's mind. According, I genuinely think he lost his mind. And added, I don't believe he ever recovered after his mother passed away. Zack's nefarious actions with being connected with two deaths eventually caught the attention of the authorities, bringing an end to a short-lived but dangerous spree that left the community in shock and despair. On the 4th of June, 1996, an unfortunate call set a chain of events into motion. Michael Dwayne Zack III was at the bar when his girlfriend rang him up, informing him of his eviction from her apartment. Edith Pope, the compassionate bartender, handed over her car keys to Zack, enabling him to fetch his belongings. However, Zack had other plans and didn't return. He headed west to Panama City, blending into the crowd at a local bar, where he crossed paths with Bobby Chandler, a construction business owner. Impressed by Zack, Chandler offered him a job, and even a place to stay upon discovering Zack was living out of the stolen car. But on the night of the 11th of June, Zack seized a couple of guns and $42 from Chandler's wallet before vanishing into the night. The next day, he pawned the guns in Niceville. Zack's trail of deceit led him to Okaloosa County, where yet another bar visit brought him face to face with a new woman he hadn't met before, Laura Rocio. They decided to head to the beach, reportedly for a drug-induced escape. But things took a horrifying turn as Zack assaulted Rocio, leaving her lifeless body concealed behind a sand dune. He then made his way to Joe's Dirty Bar near Pensacola, where Ravone Smith was earning her living. The modest crowd allowed Smith to spend time conversing with Zack. She even invited her friend Russell Williams over to kill the boredom. As the day transitioned into the evening, around 7 p.m., Smith, Williams, and Zack decided to head to the beach. They enjoyed some time there before returning to the bar. Once back, Williams bid them goodbye while Zack accompanied Smith to her home. Upon arrival at Smith's residence, the atmosphere changed drastically. Without warning, Zack attacked Smith, hitting her head with a beer bottle. The impact sent glass shards flying and blood splattering across the room. Terrified and hurt, Smith tried to find refuge in the master bedroom, but Zack was relentless. He followed her and began to assault her. Escaping his clutches momentarily, Smith staggered into the guest bedroom, but Zack was not done. He forced her head onto the wooden floor, further injuring her. With every ounce of sinister intent, Zack then made his way to the kitchen, fetching an oyster knife. He returned to where Smith lay, now in a dire state, and stabbed her mercilessly four times in the chest. His gruesome act didn't end there. He meticulously washed the blood off the knife in the kitchen, tucked away Smith's blood-soaked clothes into a dresser drawer, and then looted her home. Smith's car, television, VCR, and purse. He took them all. Zack then carried on with his sinister evening, removing the license plate and some personal belongings from Pope's stolen Honda and abandoning it in a nearby lot. Driving back to Panama City in Smith's car, he attempted to pawn the stolen goods. However, his luck ran out as the shop clerk grew suspicious, asking Zack for identification. Zack, sensing trouble around the corner, quickly fled the shop and abandoned Smith's car. Upon noticing the suspicious behavior from Zack, 
the shop clerk promptly alerted police authorities. They arrived swiftly and inspected the abandoned car left behind by Zach. The vehicle was traced back to Ravon Smith, and this led the police to Smith's residence. As they arrived, a grim scene awaited them. They discovered Smith's lifeless body, marking the beginning of a painstaking investigation into the horrifying crime that had taken place. The initial phase of the investigation involved meticulous forensic examination and an autopsy of Smith's body. These preliminary activities were crucial in gathering substantial evidence and understanding the violence of the crime. The evidence gathered from the crime scene began to shape the narrative, pointing towards the heinous act committed by Zach. As the forensic experts delved deeper, pieces of evidence started connecting Zach to the murder. The traces of violence imprinted on Smith's body and the evidential trail left behind at the crime scene were meticulously analyzed. The connection started becoming clearer, and Zach's image emerged as the perpetrator behind this gruesome act. The authorities now had a substantial lead and a clear suspect. The hunt for Zach commenced. The objective was clear to apprehend Zach and ensure justice for Ravone Smith. The law enforcement agencies embarked on a determined pursuit fueled by the evidence pieced together by the forensic findings. The community, too, was shaken by the horrendous act. As the news spread, a cloud of fear and uncertainty hung over them. But amidst this, law enforcement's resolve to capture Zach and solve the cold case of Ravone Kennedy Smith was stronger than ever. On June 16, 1996, the law finally caught up with Michael Dwayne Zack III. The Escambia County Sheriff's Office arrested Zack, who was then 27, for the horrific crimes he committed against Ravon Kennedy Smith. The charges were grave. S.A. robbery and first-degree murder. The evidence was strong and led to an indictment by the grand jury on June 25, 1996. Following his arrest, Zach found himself cornered, and the gravity of his actions began to unfold as he confessed to the murder of Smith and the thefts involving Pope and Chandler. During the confession, Zach shared his version of the events on that fateful day. According to him, he and Smith engaged in consensual sex, but a comment made by Smith regarding his mother's murder triggered a violent reaction from him. He claimed that the altercation began in the hallway, contrary to the evidence of the immediate attack upon entering the house. Zach narrated that in the heat of the moment, he believed Smith was going to retrieve a gun from the guest bedroom prompting him to arm himself with a knife for what he claimed was self-defense. The trial of Michael Dwayne Zack III kicked off before the Honorable Joseph Q. Tarbuck on September 8, 1997. It was a week-long intense scrutiny of evidence and testimonies, with the jury returning guilty verdicts on all counts by September 15, 1997. The penalty phase spanned from October 14th to the 17th, 1997, and the jury, with a decisive vote of 11 to 1, recommended the death sentence for Zach. The trial court heeded the jury's recommendation, and on November 14th, 1997, Zach was sentenced to death. The trial judge identified six aggravating circumstances supporting the death sentence. Zach was on felony probation during the crime. The crime was committed alongside robbery, sexual battery, or burglary. Zach committed the crime to dodge lawful arrest. The crime was for financial gain. The crime was especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel. And 
it was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner. The judge acknowledged four mitigating circumstances, but gave them little weight. Zack's mental or emotional disturbance, extreme duress, lack of capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct, and non-statutory factors like remorse, confession, and good conduct while incarcerated. Zack's age didn't play in his favor as a mitigating factor. The notice of appeal was promptly filed on December 18, 1997. In the 2000 direct appeal, Zack raised 12 issues challenging both his convictions and death sentence, touching on factors like his brain damage, dysfunctional family, mental hospitalization at 11, and his alcohol and marijuana addiction, among others. Though the court acknowledged some errors, it deemed them harmless, affirming Zack's sentence in October of 2000. Fast forward to 2002, Zack sought post-conviction relief, which evolved through 2005, 2013, 2017, and 2018, exploring various angles, including ineffective counsel and unconstitutionality of his sentence under different precedents and intellectual disability claims. Noteworthy was his claim of intellectual disability based on the U.S. Supreme Court's 2000 decision in Hall v. Florida, which was dismissed as the court found Zach's IQ scores too high to qualify for an intellectual disability claim. Through these years, Zach's appeals and post-conviction motions traversed through the complexities of the legal system. They touched on various legal doctrines, ineffective assistance claims, the proportionality of the death penalty given Zach's mental impairments, and the constitutionality of his sentence under evolving legal standards. Each stage of appeal brought forth an array of legal arguments, court hearings, and rulings, all culminating in affirmations of Zach's guilt and the appropriateness of his sentence. Despite many appeals, Zach couldn't get his sentence changed. He fought hard in court after his conviction, but the judges stuck to their decision, stressing how serious his crimes were and that the legal process which led to his death sentence was solid. On the morning of Tuesday, October 3, 2023, Michael Dwayne Zack III awoke at 5.30 a.m. in the confines of Florida State Prison, located in Rayford, a quiet town about 45 miles southwest of Jacksonville. The first meeting of the day was with his wife and Kristen. Although they spent time together, she was not permitted to witness the final moments of her husband's life in the execution chamber. Later in the day, Zach spent time with his spiritual advisor, perhaps seeking solace and acceptance in the face of the inevitable. Zach chose not to have a last meal, a rite usually extended to inmates on death row, according to Florida prison officials. His legal battle saw multiple appeals, a last-ditch effort to halt the execution, all of which were denied. Just a day before, on October 2nd, the U.S. Supreme Court turned away from his plea, refusing to halt the execution. They issued two orders declining to intervene, thereby upholding the decisions by the Florida Supreme Court and the 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, which also refused to issue stays of execution. As the clock ticked away, the final moments arrived. When the question of any last words was posed to Zach, he responded affirmatively. Yes, sir. Lifting his head towards the observation window, he proclaimed his love. I love you all. The method chosen for Zach's execution was lethal injection. The execution team administered a cocktail of drugs at 6.02 p.m., which induced a sedative to calm him, a paralytic to immobilize him, and finally, 
a drug to stop his heart. By 6.14 p.m., Zach was pronounced dead. Though there were no visible signs of breathing after the first minute post-administration. In the audience of the execution chamber sat the family of Ravon Smith, silently witnessing the closure of a chapter that had haunted them for so long. However, they chose to remain silent and did not speak to the media afterwards. Laura Rocio's family, representing Zach's other victim, was absent. The media, particularly the Pensacola News Journal, which is part of the USA Today network, made attempts to reach both families through the state attorney's office before the execution, but the families opted not to comment. In the aftermath, Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty shared a written statement by Zach. In it, Zach reflected on his past acknowledging the pain and hurt he had caused, not just to the victims and their families, but to his own circle as well. He expressed daily remorse and a desire to make his existence mean more than the worst actions of his past. His statement concluded with a message to Governor Ron DeSantis and the Clemency Board, expressing love, forgiveness, and prayers for them. After a long wait of 27 years, Ravone Kennedy Smith's family finally found closure to her case. Though they chose to remain silent, avoiding any public commentary, the resolution of the case brought them a semblance of peace. The justice placed on the perpetrator Michael Dwayne Zack III undoubtedly marks an end to the harrowing chapter in their lives. The punishment served to Zack could be seen as a form of retribution for the horrific act he committed all those years ago, providing the Smith family with a sense of finality and justice for their beloved daughter. What are your thoughts on the resolution of the Ravone Kennedy Smith case? Does the punishment of Michael Dwayne Zack III bring a sense of closure or stir up more emotions? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We're keen to hear your insights. If there's a particular case you'd like us to delve into, feel free to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. Your engagement fuels our drive to bring more captivating true crime stories to the fore. For more intriguing true crime narratives, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel.